our city council work session meeting. Our meetings are public and you're welcome to join us in person or by watching from the council's agenda page, Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. We hope you'll continue to join us in whatever manner you feel most comfortable. This is a work session meeting during which there is no public comment. Please join us on Tuesday, May 21st during our 7 p.m. formal meeting to share your comments. We of course welcome your feedback anytime by mail to P.O. Box 145-476, Salt Lake City, Utah 84114-5476, by email at council.comments at slcgov.com, or via our 24-hour phone comment line at 801-535-7654. Comments we receive on agenda topics are shared with council members and posted to our website, slccouncil.com. We'll now begin our work session and our first agenda item is uh, the fiscal year 2425 budget administrations overview and revenue update. Mary Beth Thompson, Chief Financial Officer, Lisa Hunt, Deputy Chief Financial Officer, and Andrew Johnston, Director of Homelessness Policy and Outreach, will join us at the table. Greg, did you want to come hang out with us too? We're going to take Greg Cleary as well. Andrew, I'd like you to thank you for the haircut, for showing up. We feel very respected. Glad you recognize me. <laughs> Mary Beth, the time is yours. Thank you, Council Chair, and thank you, Council Members, for um, allowing us to speak on this budget overview. I'll get the mic a little closer. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do the introduction, then Lisa will take over with um, revenues, and then Greg will do expenditures, and then... Andrew is going to do our consolidated homeless budget like we always present um, present to you. So next slide, please. Um, this year, the budget committee added two new um, department directors. Katie Lewis and Chief Brown were added. Um, we have created a new section. It's the public safety section for the budget committee. So you can see the budget committee has grown a bit. And then we also added Damian Choi from the um, administration. Next slide, please. Um, we went through several reiterations of the matrix and last year you you found that we had i think we had eight or nine different areas in the matrix this year we consolidated them um, the first one we consolidated was environmental social and community benefits the second was reliance and core services and then we had the mayor's goals the council goals and the mandate and legal obligations um, each department scored all of their insights and then we walked through those insights and took, obviously, either the highest, but the first one that we always took off the top was inflationary and contractual obligations. That was the very first thing that we took into consideration. Next slide, please. I guess that's me. Um, so we're gonna move on to the general fund revenue portion of the budget. Um, the FY25 recommended budget for the general fund is $475,245,078. Um, that is an increase of $26.7 million from the previous budget year. Um, just to highlight a couple of the major changes to the revenues um, in property tax, we're seeing, uh, yeah, you can leave it there, that's okay. In property taxes, you're seeing an increase of about $4.4 .4 million. Um, most of this is from new growth, stabilization, and the RDA and inland port increments make up the majority of that. Now we haven't received final new growth numbers or our final judgment levy numbers, so these are subject to change when we receive those from the county. Hopefully they'll go up. Um, in sales and use tax, we're seeing an increase of $11.1 .1 million in this area. Um, this is generally coming from sales tax. We're seeing healthy retail spending, um, but we're also seeing increases in the Questar and the Rocky Mountain Power energy rates, and their increase in rates is um, causing an increase to our, our use tax in those areas. 
In licenses and permits, um, I think those are together in there. So licenses and permits are together as a, as a consolidated group, but uh, about $1.7 million is an increase in new licenses and then as a result of airport parking and our innkeepers tax. And then there is a decrease in the, on the permit side of about $3.6 million. And the department has indicated that just development is still slow due to um, increased development costs and increase in interest rates. Um, our inner fund reimbursement is up about $5.9 million. There's two things impacting this. One is our admin fees. Those are increasing um, due to the COLA increase that's being recommended. And then the police reimbursement from the airport shows an increase here, and there is an offsetting expense to that for the police department. Um, the other area of major change is um, in our transfers area, a reduction of $4.4 million. This is due to the removal of the insurance premium holiday that we had last year. Remember, we had two of those, about $2 million. And also, we're seeing finally the end of our ARPA funding. Any questions on that? Um, you could skip the next slide if you would, because that's what I just went over. Um, just to show you a little history of property taxes, we're anticipating um, that the total property values in the city will increase by about $4.3 million. The major contributor, again, is the RDA increment. Um, real and personal both increase by a million dollars each. And right now we're showing the judgment levy decreasing 1.2 million. Hopefully, as I said, that may change. Um, but in total, property tax is an increasing trend. Next slide. Um, so these, I show you guys this every year. Hopefully it's of interest to you, but uh, this is commercial property by council district, just showing the trend in the value of those properties. Almost all council districts have an increase in their assessed property value. Um, the highest increase is in district one and two. Those uh, were 23 and 30% respectively. And the lowest increase was in District 8, but still an, or sorry, District 7, but still an, <laughs> still an 8% increase there. I know, right? <laughs> District 7 is 8%, so it's still a decent increase there. Um, next slide, please. So a similar story on the residential property by council district. Almost all of those have increased um, in assessed property value, except District 3, um, but that was only a 1% decline. The highest uh, increases are in District 4, and that was a 12% increase. Next slide, unless you have any questions. This is a history of our general sales tax revenue. Um, the city's revenue for the current year is projected to be $8.9 million. Um, this projection is $3.5 million below the budgeted amount. Um, I think we, we gave you an a update a couple of weeks ago about that. This, we're just seeing a weaker economy and higher inflation, which seems to be reducing consumer spending. So this year, um, our budget in sales tax is expected to be 94 million, which is an increase of 1.5. We, we really feel like the economy is, even though it's slower pace right now than in recent years, the growth is anticipated to continue, but we do expect that those conditions will ev eventually ease into this next year. So we do have a positive outlook for that. N next slide. So these are the gross point of sale tax receipts. As you can see on here, retail trade is really doing well with a growth rate of 2%. Food service and accommodations is seeing a growth rate of three. Um, what isn't doing well is manufacturing and wholesale trade. Those are both down um, eight and 10% uh, respectively. So that's probably what's causing the biggest hit to our sales tax receipts. Councilwoman Young. I know this is a bit of a projection, but do we assume that that's lag from the pandemic or do we uh, a trend related to those particular um, sectors maybe not having as much of a presence in Salt Lake City? 
Um, you know, I would be speculating, but um, we don't see this as a lag from the pandemic. We didn't, we saw that recovery and now we're seeing it, this, this slowdown again, so. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Do we have historical data on what turnarounds look like that? So if, if manufacturing is experiencing a lag, is this something that we should anticipate going forward for a significant amount of time? It feels like with the Northwest Quadrant work that's going on and the port work going on that it instinctively feels like it wouldn't be a terminal status for us. Do we have any ideas, at least what some general guiding principles about how to interpret this are? I don't have it on hand, but we do have those historicals okay. and I can certainly get that for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If no other questions on the revenue, I'll turn it over to Greg to discuss expenses with you guys. Thanks, Lisa. <clears throat> um, yeah, as Lisa noted, next I will just provide a high level overview of the expense budget. Um, so on the next slide, um, you can see here this table um, presents our citywide expenditures for fiscal year 25. Um, the mayor's recommended budget accounts for a $125 million increase from last year across all funds um, and about a $26.7 million increase in the general fund. Uh, the airport proposes an expense increase of $56 million. Uh, while public utilities uh, sees an increase of about 44 million. Next slide, please. The table here uh, presents the general fund budget at the department level, um, totaling 475 million for fiscal year 25, with uh, some historical data points provided for reference as well. Overall, this is a 6% increase from fiscal year 24, um, with departmental increases ranging from 2% to 23%. Um, in the coming days and weeks, of course, we will spend some additional time at the department level um, and diving into some greater detail. Next slide, please. The fiscal year 25 mayor's recommended budget does account for salary and wage related increases um, at about 14 million. This includes uh, changes in employee compensation, uh, pension rates, health insurance rates, and also a 5% cost of living adjustment for all employees. Next slide. Uh, the table here uh, highlights just a few of the general fund items included in the proposed budget. Um, this does include inflationary and contractual increases seen in all departments. Um, some personnel adjustments and new positions uh, within the city attorney's office. Um, additional funding for uh, police staff overtime and also a few additional positions in public services and public lands uh, related to parks projects. Next slide, please. The table here uh, does highlight a few items that are being funded by Funding Our Future. These items, again, are focused on our public safety, parks, streets, homelessness, and also transit. Next slide. Um, on the screen here is our fiscal year 25 projected fund balance, um, taking into account the use of fund balance um, during fiscal year 24, and also um, factoring in use of fund balance as part of the fiscal year 25 budget. Um, this leaves the projected adjusted fund balance percent at 15.59% going into fiscal year 25. Um, with that, I'll turn the time over to Andrew, unless anyone has any questions on the expenditure side of things. Next slide, please. And again, please. 
Uh, for my first gift to the council this year is only having two slides. Uh, the first one sets the stage for the second one. The, the first one talks about some of the changes you already know about from this year that may influence some of the budget choices we're making this year. So winter, last winter we had an increase in shelter beds, uh, increase in the operations funding for state homelessness, and that takes, uh, it goes into effect July 1. This summer, a continuation of uh, many of the beds we didn't have previously in previous years, so 485 of them continuing forward, which we haven't had, which is a great impact in a positive way. The micro shelter community is a part of that, and that is actively um, still functioning and moving this summer to a new location, um, a more permanent location. And then what we haven't talked much about is Tooele has opened their own homelessness resource um, program, essentially, uh, which is a huge step forward for that county. It's a great program. But we also know by state statute this, this coming winter, both Utah County and Davis County have to have their own winter shelter plans, which should also positively impact the Wasatch Front. And then it's been clearly made by Wayne Niederhauser and the governor's office that sh additional shelter is a priority for them, and they have funding for that. And they are seeking um, a large number of permanent beds. Um, I say this because the increase in shelter beds has a great impact on our services of the city in a positive way. Next slide. I put down three categories essentially here of what you'll you'll see, and everything that I'm talking about you'll see in different budget presentations throughout the the next few weeks for you. Um, there's an increase bucket, there's a maintain bucket, and there's a right size bucket. The increased bucket includes the rapid intervention team, adding a second full-time team, which was mentioned in an earlier slide today. Um, I know there's some questions about that. I, I want to make sure to set the stage for those further discussions you're going to have um, coming up. The rapid intervention team functions as a standalone team in public services, which helps with cleanups that are smaller than uh, usually five um, tents or an encampment of smaller than five, uh, but larger than what the Advantage Services would clean up on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, they work with the uh, County Health Department on the larger ones as well, and Advantage Services will work with them on some cleanup, so they have sort of work together in concert, but they fit that middle sort of ground in our city of cleanup. Right now, what we have is one team with three people, FTEs, and their average time to clean up right now is about 23 days. So three weeks, essentially. Now, that's a policy question in a lot of ways about do you want it faster or slower. From the administration side, we believe that we really want to be more uh, responsive to the public as much as we possibly can um, when they request services. Now, I'll also point out in there that there's two things to responsiveness. One is the actual number. 23 days is an actual number we can track and say this is how long it takes us average to get to a place. However, the median in all the things I looked at is about 16 days, which means that there's a number of that are cases that are lasting a much, much, much longer pulling that average up. From a public perspective, a public perspective, excuse me, oftentimes the perception of responsiveness is as important as the number. So if there's a couple of cases that are open for 86 days, for 85 days, for 79 days, we tend to remember those cases much longer than the time they showed up a week later. Right. Uh, so one thing about having a second team is that with three people on a team, one goes down or two go down, vacation, sickness, whatever it is, you really it stops the, the, the work of that team. And with holidays, and anything else happening, you can get behind very quickly and it's hard to catch up again. With a second team, it's not only doubling the capacity overall, it's also allowing that team to not have down periods. So you don't have a camp sitting for 80 days. Um, that one example can really pull down the perception of us as a city being responsive to their needs and the cleanliness. Um, so there's two real reasons there. Drop the actual average down, which is one of our goals. And the second piece is really um, minimize the long, long standing requests for service that don't get resolved um, anytime soon. And we have to really attack both those simultaneously. It gives us that duplication of efforts. Uh, the second piece in the increased category you'll see is the Police Department Rio Grande Unit. Uh, that is a standalone police unit similar to what we have at the resource centers, which is really this winter uh, taken effect downtown, which has helped that Rio Grande neighborhood, as you've noticed. Um, that is going to be a permanent um, unit going forward with full-time staff. Currently, it's being overseen by a full-time sergeant, uh, but mostly mitigation overtime. And you saw one of the increases is police overtime in the budget. A lot of... some. I'll say a lot of that overtime is these mitigation shifts. 
um, that we're utilizing right now. So those should be replaced and those can go elsewhere in the city as we move forward. Um, down below that, in the State Homelessness Cities Mitigation Fund box, you saw this last year, that number of $3.1 million, that is not a part of this budget. It's going to be a budget amendment, but it's something we get from the state every year as a formula. It'll likely be a slightly less than that this year. We don't know what, by how much, um, but there's been more cities requesting um, money legitimately, and the formula will probably decrease ours. However, that fund will fund the uh, police units around the resource centers. Going to the second um, box to maintain Advantage Services, which is our cleaning, and then the Downtown Ambassadors. Uh, there's a slight COLA increase, but we want to maintain um, the level of service that they're providing, both Downtown, Central City, uh, Ballpark, North Temple. And then the Heart Team is part of that, that coordinates all of these together. The right size box on the far right is a number of things that we've been looking at closely to figure out, are we doing the right level of service, the right funding, the right needs for our, our neighborhood? Uh, Wigan Center and St. Vincent de Paul, uh, they do have ongoing funding, slightly less, um, partially reflecting the increase in shelter beds elsewhere, and also figuring out what their role is in the system with more shelter beds. Second piece is the portable toilets. We've just seen actual usage of those that have not been as high as we budgeted for, and so a fair amount of funding is going back into the budget every year. We've decreased that to a level which we think it will uh, be useful this, uh, this year. RVs are moving to public services. Detox beds with the expansion and moving of VOA to their uh, Redwood Road location, they've added 50 beds. Um, in previous years, when they had 65 or 70 beds, it meant that sometimes we get turned away from our apartment. Uh, so we actually paid to reserve beds. We never got a turn away, turn away. With the more beds, we think that we can decrease to one reservation and still have access as much as we need. And then the last thing is the VOA Street Outreach Team. We're still funding that. But we also know that they haven't been able to draw down their funds for a variety of staffing issues for the most part. Uh, but we're also reimagining with our partners in the state and the county what the role of outreach is in our new system. Increasingly, as more people come into shelter beds, the people who are left outside or choose to be outside for some period of time are not necessarily are resistant to services, but they have significant barriers. And our outreach teams in in years to come may have to reflect a higher degree of clinical need um, and long-term support for those folks. And so we're talking to our partners right now to figure that out with them in, in concert. That is the, the heart of the overview you're going to see in the next few weeks. And I'm willing to take questions as well. Councilmember Pui. I, uh, thank you, Andrew, for, for you know giving us the, this comprehensive view of the whole thing. I So I don't know why the state is working to, and you mentioned this, um, to expand uh, the um, the beds available, uh, and uh, they they seem to be very driven, and you know they're moving along on that issue. Um, assuming that there there is several hundreds of beds available, uh, why do we need a rapid intervention team uh, double the size? Uh, because ultimately. If there are beds available, there is enforcement possible, and we don't necessarily need to see many camps anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, the piece, of, piece of my question is, when those beds become available, what will happen with the rapid intervention team? And I struggle with hiring a bunch of people, it takes a long time to train and get them ready to go. And then maybe in a few months or halfway through the year or, or you know, or, you know, in the later part of the year, we have those bits available. What are we going to do with them or with the funding? Uh, and second, on the toilet question in there, we have uh, probably for several weeks now, many, many, um, many community members come in to tell us that there are not enough bathrooms available. So, uh, and, you know, your data is showing that there are not being utilized um to 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 what they're supposed to be so i i'm struggle with those two pieces there uh, and i still know that we are picking up um you know bodily functions from from public right away from bathrooms from behind uh from behind uh garbage cans and, and all sorts of things happening in, in many parts of the city so uh, those two are not connecting to me, so I would like a little more information about this. Sure. Uh, I'll start with the second one, the portable bathrooms. We're, what we're talking about is porta-potties. 
Uh, they're placed temporarily in a location that are usually unmonitored, although we try and monitor them when we're placed in a place. Um, what happens oftentimes is somebody will request to be in a location, a park or a public street or someplace else, a vacant lot. When it's placed there, it attracts everybody there. So now you get a large encampment. And the people who asked us to have the bathrooms there start asking us to take them away because it's drawn the uh, crowd there. It's a mixed issue for us. We're not opposed to bathrooms because they're, for your point exactly, we've also experienced that when they're placed in those locations, they're generally less, um, I'll say less inhabited or less frequented by a lot of other folks. It becomes a magnet for everybody who's unsheltered or not folks unsheltered, but everybody else coming in for their business. And that becomes the problem for us. So we're stuck in a dilemma about that. In the summertime, we see a lot of folks going to the bathroom, to the libraries, um, and even the wintertime as well. We also know we have weekend downtown. We also know we have far more folks in inside of the new shelter in West Valley, at the current shelter, is also location. So um, yes, it's a legitimate question. We've also seen that um, just putting more bathrooms out has not actually decreased issues. It's actually increased them for some areas. So it's a dilemma for us and how we manage that. Councilman Young. So I appreciate that the state and other municipalities are stepping into this space to be able to help. Um, something that I wonder that's probably beyond just the budget conversation is the ability for you and the other leaders in this space to help some of those municipalities. Um, I know that a lot of the partners that are in this space um, have been quick to reach out to some of those elected officials, but I do think that there's a great deal of expertise about everything Salt Lake has done, what we've tried, what's worked, what hasn't worked in terms of informing those next steps and just what opportunities exist to be able to share that knowledge. For for cities specifically? Yeah, you know, the, the surrounding cities that are looking um, and are now required to be a part of this solution. Uh, yes, yeah, so last uh, last year we had the task force all summer long that involved, actually two years now, all of the mayors or most of the mayors in the county or some representative for those cities. Um, that's been a really great educational experience for everybody involved, which has actually led to many more cities being willing to take on things. West Valley this year has a full shelter, Mill Creek obviously, South Salt Lake's got a lot. Um, but we've seen Sandy um, step into that space as well. So I think the task force that's going on now in the same way will also function in an educational way. The second piece is we've had discussions with leaders in Davis County who have reached out to talk about uh, what our experience has been like in creating winter only shelters because they're embarking on that this year. And so I think that is going for that message is going out. I think there is much more discussion about this. And for the most part, uh, most mayors or elected officials that I've interacted with have been very positive and supportive and, and really do want to find the right way to uh, be helpful as much as they're nervous about what they're walking into. And so we try and be honest in both ways about this. Um, the second piece is uh, that we're doing actively is actually there's a tour coming up for more elected officials from the state level, primarily, of the micro shelter community. Um, not just to show off sort of the buildings and the program, but also to talk through um, different ways to address this in different communities. Uh, one size doesn't fit all, obviously, and so we're making sure with our state partners in this case uh, that the word is getting out as broad as we can, as often as we can, um, and as positively as we can. I think to uh, a question that uh, Councilmember Pui had a second ago that I didn't get to, unfortunately, I apologize, was the rapid intervention team. So you're right. More shelter beds are coming. I couldn't tell you when. I know that for this next winter, the goal is 900 to 1,000 beds, so I trust that that will happen by October or November. Um, the rapid intervention team does have to get up and going quickly, obviously, because the summers are our high point for those needs. Um, I would also posit from the administration side that three weeks to wait for a response is a long time. And the worst case scenarios are 80 days. We're talking about multiple months in those cases. Uh, I think that for our public interaction with, with our, our constituents, it's helpful to say, yes, we hear what you're saying. Yes, we're identifying that. And yes, we can get there within a reasonable amount of time, even on holidays and with short staff and those kind of things. So uh, the concern about having too much of a rapid intervention team, I can get that. Um, I'm not sure of a city of our, our growth potential and where we're moving with the number of people and the issues um, that will be uh, overstaffed in the cleaning end of things downtown or other parts of the city. Um, so I think we're erring on the side of saying, let's make sure we're as responsive as we can, um, particularly with that perception that we just don't address stuff quickly at all or within a month. I think we need to do better on that. 
Councilwoman Lopez Travis. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for this kind of comprehensive report, as you mentioned. Um, there's kind of different operations in the homelessness space. Would you mind articulating to me how many of our employees target just outreach? How many do bio waste cleanup and how many help access, uh, help these clients access low barrier housing? I'd like to see some mm -hmm. of those metrics. That would help me. Sure. I, I think from the, um, the bio waste cleanup, we have a metric for how often we're addressing that. And our average is about two days to get to a cleanup right now. That's through Advantage Services. And so Advantage has a number of teams within their agency that go out to a number of areas on a daily basis and then one offs as well. So I can get you the total number of staff they've got if that would be helpful. Um, or, or how many cases do they respond to, if not uh, oh. the employees then, because it's contracted out through Advantage Services? Sure. Um, I can get you that offline if that'd be helpful. Uh, I can say that um, right now. How much cleanup, you know, is it a bucket and shovel cleanup daily? Are we seeing hundreds oh, of them? Or? It's a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, these teams are full time every five days a week across the city. Downtown is a big uh, hot spot for them. Um, but they're also doing the, the basic cleaning everywhere and they're doing the one-off cleans we're asking them to in coordination with the rapid intervention team. Sometimes um, it's even following up a, a health department intervention with a significant size. Um, so they're sort of, the health department is the big thing coming with a lot of equipment and then the rapid intervention team is sort of the moderate. Advantage is doing everything else underneath that um, that we're not seeing very often. In addition to the Advantage Services team, the downtown ambassadors actually are also picking up trash themselves in their areas as part of their uh, routines. Um, so that's not the bio waste stuff, but that's just litter on the ground, things that make it feel like it's uh, unclean in an area. Um, so we've asked them to do that as well in addition. I think the second question you had was about outreach. How many, how many employees are conducting this outreach? Because there, there's all these touch points. Mm -hmm. and. What I want to understand and to provide to the public is that it's actually leading to entry to low barrier housing, mm -hmm. seeing a success in the space, or at a minimum, right, in terms of cleanliness and hygiene, a response to that. Mm -hmm. So the, the cleaning is our contracts as a city. We also fund one outreach team through Volunteers of America, which is two people. No, sometimes three, but usually it's been two who go out together a minimum. Uh, the county funds, a, um, the state actually funds a county-wide team that spent a lot of time in this in this city, but city and county-wide. And then Salt Lake County funds a team in uh, of one to two people in the libraries. And that's really all the outreach. There's some private groups going out, but sometimes we have a perception there's a lot, dozens of people going out and doing outreach. It's not, it's very few. Um, in cities where we've seen great success in resolving camps, they've done a couple of things. One is they've had more housing or shelter. You're really, if you're going to go out as an outreach team and offer services, we can do what we've done for years, which is give basic needs, food, uh, tarps, socks, those kind of things, which is good. But if you want to resolve camps into housing or services, you need a team that's dedicated to figuring out how do we know this person by name and what their needs are and then have the resources. So from the state level, working on the shelter numbers from our side in the county and the state saying, what's our outreach team got to look like going forward so we can hit all the bases? And again, to my point earlier, as we get to fewer folks outside, the barriers go much higher. And we're going to need a different expertise and a different way of looking at outreach in those ways in the future. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Can you explain what it means that RVs are moving to public services? What change should we expect with that? Uh, there's two, well, there's multiple pieces. Um, there's obviously the, the enforcement piece, which you funded last year for a full team to do enforcement of parking. Um, the RV servicing, though, is out the repair program we've had and then the wastewater program as well. So those are going to be accounted for under public services. Um, we are still working. Now, there are a number of places to take west, wastewater for free in the county. Um, we have not offered that as a city, as a location. We've offered is um, for the mobile for cleanup um, private companies to come to the location of the RV and pick up their uh, wastewater for them on our tab. Um, that's been underutilized, frankly. And so the outreach team's working with the RV team because they're out there every day talking to RVs um, to get that more widely known and more utilized. So it'll be accounted for under public services instead of under heart. Okay, so, but we should still anticipate that we're gonna be dealing with them. Yes. Um, can I ask, um, a not homelessness question about the other things we talked about. Um, I probably fixate to my own detriment on investigating revenue streams that are not property tax dependent for 
the city. Our economic development department is the lowest funded in the city by a not insignificant measure. Is that typical for cities of our size? Are there other resources that we can look at to create? I know there are revenue streams in other departments. I know building permits are revenues, for instances, but you know, economic development really should be the engine to assist us with revenue growth. Is there, is this typical? I don't know, council chair, but we can do some research and some I, benchmarking on it to yeah, see. I, I would really typical. love to know okay. what's best practice for a city of our size and growth trajectory. Happy to do so. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Any other questions, homelessness or other budget wise? Thank you all very much. Um, with that, we are going to move on to our fiscal year 24-25 budget council staff overview. We're going to invite Jennifer Bruno, council deputy director. I see Ben Ludke is coming with her. So like the two best brains I've ever met about this stuff at one table. And then I think Mary Beth is sticking around to be back up if we need her. I would hope she'll pop up if there's any questions that come my way that she's better equipped to answer. I also acknowledge that this is your hot season, so if you need a moment, we can, we can, <laughs> we can muscle through without you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, the presentation you just received from the administration focused a lot on the um, details, the nuts and bolts of the budget, the nuts and bolts of revenue. Um, and the purpose of this presentation is really to look at the budget through the lens of um, what some of the council's priorities um, have been, both in this year and in recent years. So if you go to the next slide, please. The council has um, what I think is a very important role in the city budget. Um, you consider, before adopting the mayor's um, recommended budget, you consider if it addresses the policy goals that you've um, discussed over the last year. You evaluate whether or not the budget furthers the city's commitment to social equity as well as some of the other priorities. You evaluate if the budget is meeting the service levels um, that your constituents are asking you about in the various areas city interfaces with them. You also evaluate whether any of the decisions you're making this year will affect future budget years, because obviously future councils will have to address those impacts, and then any potential unintended consequences of those decisions. And then through um, the whole discussions, we always have the lens of, are we using taxpayer dollars efficiently, since that's really the whole point of these public discussions and exercises. Next slide, please. These are just, um, and I realize how much text is on this slide, geez, sorry, we put this together quickly. We can probably skip it. Um, the, the, these are some of the high level takeaways um, from the budget. It is a very, um, uh, I would say, slow growth kind of budget. It's adding significantly fewer FTEs this year than has been added in previous years. That said, it does use significantly more one-time money to balance the budget than in previous years. Um, previous years, we were actually expecting a property tax increase that would be needed this year, but because of the city's healthy savings account, um, I, I guess it's safe to say that the administration has proposed a budget that uh, puts off a property tax increase for another year, potentially more. They've in indicated that they're going to pursue a zero-based budgeting exercise where they'll evaluate different departments for um, if there are over-resources in some areas and under-resources in other areas. Uh, next slide, please. One of the other uh, places that um, the this uh, council is important to engage with the budget is balancing the different policy areas. Um, so of course, there's no such thing as an easy decision and there's pros and cons to every decision. Um, this chart just attempts to go through um, some of those areas. Using one-time money is both uh, good because it allows you to have a balanced budget without a property tax increase. And if you have money in your savings account that's not being used, it's good to use it. That said, it also adds, potentially adds to the structural deficit in the future. And we'll talk more about the structural deficit as we go on through all these discussions. 
The um, proposed budget includes the annual consumer price index increase for all city fees, with the exception of youth uh, um, recreation fees that we discussed last week. Um, this allows the city to keep pace with inflation. We've heard from constituents in the past that small regular increases are easier to adjust for than several, you know, spaced out large increases. Um, I did want to make a small correction also on the CPI. In the staff report, it lists the percentage increase at 3.3%. We've confirmed with finance that it's actually 4% increase in the city fees, and that has to do with the um, line item that it uses in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's very technical, but it has to do with we use an inflation figure that backs out inflation for food and energy increases. That was a policy choice made several years ago, and so um, you you could um, the council could elect to pick a different metric by which to adjust inflation. That's just what is in the ordinance right now. The um, budget adds, like I said, several FTEs. This healthy growth in the budget allows the city to keep pace with uh, matching increases in demand from a growing constituency, but it also causes you to um, potentially think, are we adding FTEs in the right place, in the right places to meet those service level demands? Are the FTE additions in the appropriate places? The alternative response models, that is something that um, the council really let out on, um, actually even predating um, 2020. And I think it's accurate to say that every department jumped in full force with ideas of how um, services could be delivered differently. I think that um, there's not, there's still not quite enough operational data to evaluate whether we're deploying all of those resources in a way where we're not accidentally duplicating or um, if we're deploying resources in the mo most appropriate way. The administration is embarking on um, defining those response models and we'll be providing that information to the council, but I think that the metrics are still um, forthcoming. The increased reliance on sales tax revenue, you'll notice in the pie chart about revenues that um, the administration went through and that is in the overview staff report, sales tax represents a larger portion of the pie than it used to, which is both great and then comes with a trade-off that sales tax revenue is something that you guys can't control. It's controlled by the eco economic conditions. And so if it shrinks, you need to uh, make up that revenue with other sources. And then um, CIP is one of those things that were technically they're one-time projects, but really you need to fund CIP on an ongoing basis in order to keep pace with um, the needs in the city. This year is very unique in that you were able to allocate $15 million from fund balance towards deferred maintenance. That will not be the case every year. And so from a budget analysis perspective, we still look at what is that ongoing contribution to CIP and are we keeping pace with our needs? The next slide, please. The purpose of this chart is just to show kind of the general trajectory of revenues. It was more helpful, I think, when we were coming out of um, the previous Great Recession, just so that we could see what in general was happening with our budget. And I think what you can see here is that there's, um, while there is growth in general fund revenue, it's a slower pace of growth than has been in previous years, which is both a good thing and a, a tempering thing to know that we're growing, but we're not growing as fast as we did in a couple of years. Next slide, please. This um, chart and uh, kind of extra information shows the distribu distribution of revenue and really what um, we focus on once the council gets the budget is what are the sources of revenue that the council can control. So for example, if there was an initiative that was not in the mayor's budget that you wanted to add, what would the um, what would the revenue levers be that you could pull? And really the only sources that you can control are the use of fund balance. So you can increase the amount of money you're pulling from the savings account. You can increase property taxes, or you can increase one of the several other revenue streams, typically fees, fines, um, things like that. The budget does include some of these levers. Um, the the Administration is proposing $1 million property tax stabilization, which I will go into um, in some of the later slides. It's kind of a rabbit hole of a technicality, but it's a very interesting um, exercise and I think um, enables the city to keep revenue that it would otherwise leave, uh, lose on an ongoing basis. So I'll go more into that later. But it also, the budget, as they mentioned, also includes, includes that CPI 
adjustment. So now I'll get into some of the specific, oh, next slide, please, uh, priorities that the council sent to the administration for their consideration um, in uh, evaluating things. The um, maintenance backlog was something that came out of the council's retreat as one of the most important things in the budget. And so this chart just highlights in the various departments where um, the budget makes moves on that topic. The, obviously, the biggest one is $15 million from budget amendment number five towards CIP, and I believe we just got the updated CIP book with that um, information in it. Um, but there are, are also several other um, areas in the budget that that address this maintenance back backlog. I think one of, the, one of the more interesting ones is increasing the mill and overlay mill and overlay program, which was started as a pilot program last year in the streets division of public services and expanding that this year. The goal being to extend the life of streets before they reach the level where they have to be completely replaced. There's also an additional FTE for the opening of Glendale Park. And while you could debate whether or not Glendale is an existing asset or a new asset, I think um, most people would think of it as an existing asset that needs to be taken care of. Otherwise, it's a shuttered piece of land that does nothing for the community. So that's a, an investment in an existing asset. Next slide, please. This um, is just a brief overview of some of the projects in the CIP log that are also... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, just to... Sorry to interrupt you, but... No, you're okay. If we um, you know, didn't want to to fund new positions with one-time money or, or give increases or whatever. Um, there, our fund balance is already, cat, you know, we, have, we can't just endlessly put money in fund balance. Right? That is accurate. So we just have to put more of that money into deferred maintenance then? Or one-time expenses? That is accurate, yes. Um, I, I would have to check with finance about what that dollar amount would be. I don't. I don't think we were. I think after allocating the 15 million in budget amendment number five, the city was in a good position as it relates to not being near that cap of fund balance. So I can get back to you with what that number would be. But yes, you you have several times over the last couple of years taken um, money out of fund balance because you have hit that cap. But on the previous slide. It's showing that some of the maintenance is requiring us to hire new employees as well. Or it's being proposed that new employees are necessary to perform that maintenance, right? I, that Yes, I think that's the way that um, public lands would view that. Okay. And uh, where are all of those positions just in public lands? No. Um, sorry, um, if you go to the previous slide, Scott. Um, this is just a snapshot of budget items relating to maintenance. It's not necessarily a holistic view of all the FTEs. That'll be on a later slide. Okay. Um, and, maybe, and, we, and we can go through. And, and <laughs> because of the speed at which we put these slides together, there very well may be an FTE or two that I missed. Um, I notice, in fact, there are two... FTEs that they're reclassifying from seasonal to do signs and markings. I think that that would also probably that fall in that maintenance category of striping streets and um, replacing signs and things like that. Hey, Madam Chair, just on, mm -hmm. on that same token on the uh, maintenance backlog, this is just a snapshot of some of them because it, we, I think last year, the year prior, we talked about being 10 to $13 million in back in deferred maintenance for just irrigation system in public lands, yeah. which is not addressed in this slide at all. Right. Yes, this does not include um, any of those. If you go to the next slide, Scott, the slide with um, yes. Yeah, so a lot of several of these CIP projects, I think, are CIP projects that have been hanging fire for many years that are now. Um, being addressed due to the infusion of that $15 million. There, there's more than $15 million on this um, list because the CIP committee also scored the projects uh, based on a decision matrix that was informed by the council's desire to address existing city facilities. So, um, yeah, I think the total about $33 million, $32.3 million in um, maintenance adjacent or maintenance type projects um, is 
Yeah. And this list also, because I keep on going back to the irrigation system that we talked about for the public lands across all of our parts. And that's, uh, I think it was last year during their slides, that's not addressed here either, or I didn't see it anywhere. It is um, not that I've noticed, but we can add that to our list of questions for public lands yeah. for um, them to respond to how, what the plan is for that. There is a $4 million project in the Gulf Fund for irrigation. Um, but that does not include parks yeah, and yeah. public lands. Yeah, that's just a Rose Park one, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. The next um, is a um, snapshot, and actually I realized I didn't update the title of this. This should be Community Outreach. Um, Oh no, equity and diversity. I'm, I apologize. These are all the diversified response uh, models that the council wanted to take a look at um, in terms of have we deployed these resources efficiently? And I, um, I've listed the different areas in the different departments where there either have been, there are, is a proposed addition to these um, diversified response models or um, a reallocation. So for example, your question about the RV um, servicing program is moving to public services. There are two FTEs proposed in the fire department that would expand the medical response paramedics model, which helps um, the chat team. And then there is a community outreach case manager in the justice court, which you'll discuss more when you get into that. Um, department. Several of the other items in the um, other departments are just continuations of programs. I should have highlighted the rapid intervention team, the three FTEs that are being added in public services to double that item. Next slide, please. We discussed maintaining a healthy rainy day fund. This um, budget would still leave fund balance at about 15.59%, about 12.3 million over the 13% threshold. Next slide, please. City co employee compensation was also a, a desire of the council to address um, inflation that's experienced by employees. So the proposed budget includes a 5% cost of living adjustment. The union negotiations are still ongoing and that'll be the subject of future council conversations. The budget includes an increased contribution to um, employee HSAs, as well as CCAC recommendations for various positions citywide. HR also recommended based on a review of other um, mayoral salaries in Utah and city managers in Utah, an adjustment to the mayor's salary, which automatically triggers an adjustment to the council's salary. Next slide, please. Community outreach and engagement was one of the other um, policy areas that the council wanted to look at, not just from the perspective of are we engaging effectively, uh, are we engaging enough, but also from the perspective of are we engaging effectively. So you'll see that there are some positions that relate to outreach and engagement um, that are being added. And one of the policy questions that we've um, listed is um, how those positions interface with each other and with the centralized engagement team in um, IMS. I should note here, one of the positions I've highlighted is it's not technically a community outreach position, although it is some, somewhat outward facing, is the senior advisor to the mayor for downtown projects. I think that based on the draft job description that was attached to the um, overview staff report, you'll see that that position would um, engage with the private sector and the community as some of these um, major projects downtown, like Main Street Pedestrian uh, Mall, the Green Loop, and the downtown sports entertainment culture and convention districts move forward. The administration let us know that they are requesting a straw poll for that item um, at today's meeting so that they can advertise that position as soon as possible. And um, the position would likely take several weeks to fill, so the money wouldn't be released until July 1, like the rest of the fiscal year budget, but they would like a straw poll today, if possible, if the council's interested in that. And we can come back to that at the end of this, if that's okay. Um, let's see, are there any questions about any of these positions or maybe we, I, I guess we can just keep going. Next slide, please. In updating our um, overview, it felt odd to eliminate highlights from the budget on housing and transit and transportation. And so we kind of just decided to 
bring some of those priorities forward and just say, you know, here's the progress because you'll never, we'll never probably have a council that says, no, no, we're probably done with transportation or housing. <laughs> so, um, and there is um, very significant investment in both of those areas in the budget. Um, it continues a lot of the investment from funding our future for the frequent transit network. It adds three million, three hundred thousand dollars for the West Side on demand ride service and continues the hive passes for public school kids and guardians and teachers. Um, that was an interest of several council members. I know in housing space, um, most of the housing of, in terms of housing development is an RDA, but it also continues the funding our future for several of the thriving in place. Um, implementation initiatives relating to renter stability. Uh, business support and economic development, it continues funding for the construction mitigation program, which we've heard from constituents and businesses is very popular and well used. Um, it also, I wanted to note, because it was an interest of the council in previous years, the apprenticeship program is being reduced in non-departmental, although not being reduced in effect citywide. So departments have absorbed the cost in their budgets and have not asked for funding from non-departmental. One thing we've discussed with the administration that they seem totally amenable to would be having a line item in each department for apprenticeship payments so that the council could be guaranteed that a department wouldn't you know, reprioritize money within its own budget and eliminate those things. So I just wanted to highlight that for the council in case it was something important. Council Member Young, sorry. So I just have a, a couple questions about items, and this is more so to raise for when we get to these items in the budget. Um, so I think the first one is related to um, the existing Hive passes um, for students. I would just be curious what the cost would be related to servicing students outside of the Salt Lake School District, yet inclusive of Salt Lake City residents. So for example, like if I attended a school that was a charter school, like what does that look like in terms of cost? Um, a secondary question that I have um, is more so related, I think, to the livable streets program. Um, I know that we have a lot of construction um, across the city in D7 as well, um, and that is creating a lot of traffic overflow into our neighborhoods and, and creating kind of unsafe conditions for our residents. And so I, it, it is surprising to me to see that we don't have additional resources related to that program, just knowing the needs um, and noting that we have staff that are working on that program and just trying to figure out like how that staff moves forward if they don't have resources in that budget. Is it existing projects? Those are questions I have. So thank you for the opportunity to raise them. We'll absolutely follow up. I think we can just check in with transportation to see if there are if there are sufficient funds from the previous fiscal year budget to carry them through this fiscal year or what the um, plan would be for that. Um, and just so everyone knows that is in that street safety column, there are several um, CIP applications that were funded and then several CIP applications relating to street safety that were not funded. So I just wanted to make sure the council was aware of those. Um, there was also, um, Ben mentioned earlier, the investment in Japantown. So these are both um, in the RDA budget, which you'll discuss in more detail next week. But there's funding for construction documents and then 367000 for um, an art piece in Japantown streetscape. Next slide, please. So, sorry, Madam okay. Chair. Uh, Jennifer, uh, back on the transit side of the house, the, you know, the city pays for additional services, special services from UTA for bus services, east, west, just uh, frequency on that. What is the trigger for us to, uh, for UTA to take the full payment? Is it a ridership and what number is that ridership or is it, what is that trigger and how close are we are are we to that trigger so we will no longer have to be required to pay for that special services? Because I know it's quite a bit of money that we actually pay That's for That's about it. seven million total. Yeah, um, yes. Go ahead. So this, this did happen once before. Um, UTA needs to make a determination that the ridership levels reach a regionally significant level for them to take on funding the operations of that frequent every 15 minutes bus route. I don't know what, what threshold they make that determination, but as part of the 20 year agreement between the city and UTA for these bus routes, every year there is an evaluation made about 
whether it is regionally significant. And I don't think it's a 100% yes, no. I, I think there's also a gray area in between where it's almost there and UTA contributes some funding. So that addendum for the service over the next year comes to the council each summer. So okay. we can give a heads up to transportation that some more details on that evaluation would be helpful. Yeah, I'd like just to see that because I know that would save us a lot of money, but also it just shows that we are using public transportation and some of the stuff that we've been doing is promoting that is also being beneficial. I think one thing we would need to clarify is um, the way it has worked in the past. When a bus line has qualified for a regionally significant what it meant is our investment stayed the same, but we just paid for an additional bus route that we couldn't have afforded previously. I don't know that there's contemplation that we would spend less on that contract with UTA. So I think that that would be a good conversation, yeah. policy conversation to have. A absolutely. Yeah. Whether we pay the seven months, but we get an extra bus ride, that's right. been, to me, that's still a plus for us. Right. The, the previous example where UTA did take over the route was 600 North. And the city's transit master plan identifies one more route that has yet to be implemented. I believe it's 400 South and there just isn't funding to implement it right now. So to, to Jennifer's point, if UTA took over another route, 400 South might be the next one to use the funding to implement. Thanks. Mm -hmm. This slide shows um, FTEs by department and proposed uh, additions. It also shows which positions were added or subtracted in budget amendments since those are carried forward into the um, next year. And I will note, we had significantly fewer added in the budget amendments this year than in previous years, so. <laughs> um, next slide, please. This is um, just a brief uh, visual of how truth in taxation works. Um, and I think I've given this spiel to all of you before, so I can skip to the next slide. The budget does include about a million dollars for new growth. So this is the administration estimating that we, the city, will receive some new growth based on new development. That said, um, we don't control, and we won't find out um, what we actually receive until June 8th. The council members who've been here before know the fund that is that day and then several days after, because they usually miss that deadline. Um, but that will tell us if we have a million dollars to balance the budget or if we have more than a million dollars to balance the budget or if we have less than a million dollars and need to rebalance the budget. So that's a really fun message that I get to send to all of you guys on like June 9th or 10th to say either congrats, we have another 400,000 to spend or sorry, we need to <laughs> find $400,000 in cuts. And the the finance department does a good job of um, looking at building permits and certificates of occupancy because it, new growth really should be based on exact development in the city. And that's intended to be. However, based on um, the tax commission's process, there have been years that the data just does not match the final number that we get from the tax commission. There's no appeal process that the city can have to essentially, you know, argue with the tax commission's numbers. So we just, we have to take that number and go with it. So that's how that works. Um, next slide, please. This is um, the, uh, an attempt to explain the concept of property tax stabilization. So if we did not do property tax stabilization, any amount that we receive above our current year budget, so we set our current year budget, and let's say our actual amount received is a little bit more than that. If we don't do stabilization, that becomes one-time money, and we lose that money for the next fiscal year. Next slide, please. If we do do stabilization, then that becomes ongoing money. That becomes part of our new baseline. So we took the extra money we got this year, we said thank you, and we carried it forward into the future years as our future baseline. Um, in previous years, council members have been um, very interested to understand and make sure that constituents are not paying that increase, that it's not a property tax increase in the same way a different kind of property tax would be? And the answer is complicated. It basically assumes that the economy will continue growing at the current rate. So next slide, please. 
If the economy keeps growing at the same rate, that stabilization represents business investment. It represents new investment in real property, or sorry, personal property, and that that will continue. And so it will truly be new businesses paying that stabilization, that portion of the property tax budget, that stabilization. But if the economy does not continue to grow, go to next slide, please. We will have set our watermark. We will have set our city budget at a certain amount and the rate is automatically set to generate that amount. So we will be guaranteed, we the city will be guaranteed that money no matter what. And the makeup of who pays that money um, is determined by by whether the economy continues to grow or not. And this is, I'm, I apologize in advance, this is a very complicated thing to explain and this probably doesn't do it well, but <laughs> we've tried over the years. And the city has done this approach several years. Yeah, and I remember this from last year and it's ultimately, if if the economy doesn't generate that growth, we, because we are guaranteed the money that we set for a budget is basically a tax increase. Right. Could be a considered, considered. Could be. Could, could be considered. Okay. And I think right. back in 2020, we didn't do this stabilization because we thought the economy was going to be. Was we, soft. Yes, that is accurate. The, the economy yes. was uh, soft, and we said no to that stabilization. Right. Because of that, because we didn't want to add to the burden. Add to the burden yeah. of the property tax owners. Yep. Property taxpayers. So we can talk more about that as, um, and we get many questions from the constituents on it. And so we'll just keep trying to answer the question the best way we can. Next slide, please. These are all of the other um, property tax and fee proposals that we're aware of. Um, one council member was interested in understanding what would the monthly and annual impact be for an average um, home. And so this is our attempt at that. The Metro Water District has a different boundary than the city. And so that's why the value of the city library tax increase and the average value for the Metro are slightly different. And we can give more information on any of those. So you can take the slides down now, Scott. Um, maybe uh, now would be a good time to go to the straw poll for a downtown projects advisor, or does the council have any other questions on any of the other things we covered? Council, any other questions? Okay, should we move into the conversation about the straw poll? <laughs> Dan, Council Member Dugan? <laughs> I can't tell if that's a request to comment or not. <laughs> okay. I will say I do think that there's a lot going on downtown um, and that when we look at how that is currently being handled, um, it's being addressed by staff members in addition to their already full plates. Um, and I think that makes it really challenging to have a coherent, cohesive master plan related to how those components are combining. So I'm supportive of the request to be able to have a position that is specifically looking at this um, as their full time job to be able to make sure the city is in the best space to allocate resources effectively. My only concern at this point is that the job description that we've seen so far has been a very preliminary job description. And so I have questions existing around how are we going to allocate the time? Is it going to be according to the number of projects that the different entities are bringing to us, right? Like the prioritization and just making sure that if we are putting an investment in, expecting that we're going to get a lot of work on the sports entertainment culture convention district is that you know what are, what are our guarantees that we're going to get responsiveness on that as opposed to innovating other things throughout the city um so that that's my only concern at this point council member lopez travis I yeah said. i just had feedback in regards to the ongoing construction mitigation yeah i think that this is a position that could be inclusive of that obviously there's uh, capital improvement projects and helping deliver on this. So I, I'd like to see that included. That's my feedback. But I think this is a necessary FTE that we need in a city. We're growing at a rapid pace. We need someone that's in charge of this to manage it all. Anyone else? So, Councilor Young, was that a straw poll on your position? I would like to propose a straw poll uh, to support the request for the FTE related to the management of downtown projects. I'm all for that. 
Okay, great. Awesome. And then um, let's see, by way of process, we'll start um, today with uh, the finance department and the attorney's office. Um, if you look at attachment one in the overview, it goes over the schedule for the remaining departments um, in the city as we go through May and June. It's just the beginning, so much fun ahead of us. So um, please reach out to staff if there are any questions that come to mind. Any one of the budget staff um, is happy to answer questions and then um, we can facilitate getting those questions if they're better um, responded to by the department heads or departments. Um, we'll get those questions to the departments, make sure that they have them. Um, but know that the conversation is ongoing, that it's the department briefing is not your only opportunity to ask questions. Um, and it's our staff that tracks those questions as we go through so that we make sure that what you guys are adopting in June reflects the policy goals you have. Thank you so okay. much, Jen. You and Ben are remarkable and thanks for giving us all the data we need to move forward. All right, we will move on now to item number three, which is the fiscal year 24-25 budget for the finance department. So Ben is gonna stay at the table for us from the council policy analyst position. And then Mary Beth Thompson, our chief financial officer and Lisa Hunt, deputy chief financial officer will rejoin us at the table. The $13 million proposed budget for the finance department is $5 million less than last year, which is a 28% decrease. Uh, at first blush, that can seem surprising, but it is entirely caused because of removing funding for the old financial system's maintenance. Funding for the new financial system workday is being centralized in the IMS fund. There are two top priorities for the finance budget, implementing Workday and program-based budgeting, which all departments except for the airport and public utilities are now participating in. Uh, you'll see three key changes to advance those two priorities. There are two new FTEs, business systems analysts. Those are partly funded by the finance department and one third funded by IMS. There's also converting a half-time grant analyst to be full-time. And for advancing program-based budgeting, you'll see $60,000 one-time existing funding is now proposed to be ongoing. Page two of the staff report has policy questions on topics of implementing Workday, if you'd like to hear more about those new tools and how these new positions would advance using those tools. There's also a question about the Good Landlord program, its utilization and its effectiveness. And if you'd like to continue the policy discussion about a fund balance target range, Instead of just having the 13% minimum target, if you would like to have a range, a minimum and a maximum. Uh, that's it for me. We've got a presentation for you from Lisa and Mary Beth. Thank you, Ben. Okay, I've got to get this. I've got to sit up closer. I talk too quietly. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so the last time I was here, I told you that was my first presentation, and I think that was not last year, but the year prior, with the Council for the Finance Department, because we are usually written briefings. So this is my second. Um, this is our organizational structure. We have two deputies, and then we have six divisions underneath that, and then several units under that. Next slide, please. For our adopted budget, we have personal services of 10.6, proposed changes of 181, operational is 1.5 million, proposed changes of 80,000, and 2.5 FTEs. Next slide, please. Kind of want to walk through each one of these individually. Um, as Ben stated, program based budgeting, all departments besides public utilities and airport have done a line item reconciliation from their fiscal year 2024 budgets and have put them into programs at this point in time. Um, what we're hoping to do is utilize resource X to also help us with 
zero based budgeting since the departments have done so much work in their line items and put it directly to programs. I think that'll be a useful tool to help us move forward with zero based budgeting. Um, for the business system analysts and Workday, um, I said a while ago that I thought that I'd be able to reduce my staff when we implemented Workday. Um, what I didn't consider was all the new modules that um, we have put in place. And so as I was creating this slide deck, I'm like, how many new modules have we put in place that were not in the legacy financial system? So um, we've put projects, which is a brand new module, programs is a brand new module, grants, donations, a more robust procurement module, and an expenditure module. That's six brand new modules inside the new financial system, which will help you, but will also help me be able to run the financial system better. But for me to think that I was going to cut staff and add six new modules was not realistic. Um, these new modules need um, updated job aiding aids, update training, and also updating and testing the system because we have two major updates every single year that come from Workday, and those need to be tested. I currently have three, um, BS two BSAs and a lead BSA, but that's for the entire finance department. Um, I um, was looking at how many software packages the finance department has implemented over the last couple years, and it's four um, over about the last five years. Um, we've done a new business license module. We went with a new cashiering system as well as the um, as Workday. So when we did Workday, we also did a new cashiering system, which is Teller, and we've also done ResourceX. We also have three additional software packages that we want to bring on board, actually four, um, a new investment system module um, that we need to bring on board. We did an infantile on adaptive, which is a product, which is a projection and forecasting module, but we need to bring that fully on board. And so there, basically the finance department is changing all of their software packages and I can't do it with three business analysts. And then the grants position, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so, I think I can get from what a module is, but it, just tell me why does having why does having these different modules why it benefit you said it benefits us as a council? Can you explain how? Sure. Um, so, in the legacy system, projects were done by cost center, and now what happens is let's use projects for example. Let's use the um, project for the um, temporary shelter. We created a project in order to track all of the expenditures for that, and I ran a report within seconds and got the information and tracked how much we've expended in that, and it doesn't make a difference where it was expended. It could have been expended in non-departmental, it could have been expended in CAN, it could have been expended anywhere across the city, but because that project code is tied directly to that project, I can get you the costs associated with that project. The definition of a project is something that has a beginning and end date. So we, all of us, think of projects as CIP projects, but projects are much larger than just CIP projects, right? It could be um, the presidential debate. It's a project, right? It's got a begin date and it's got an end date. We want to track how much it's cost us and not just how much it's cost us that we've put into the budget, but what are the costs that we have never thought about inside that project. So that's what the new project module is intended is to better track our costs so we can come back to you and say, yeah, this is what you gave us budget for, but this is what the actuals really were. Um, the program module would be similar, but programs don't have an end date. Right? So it's something that we continue on forever. Um, in that program, we can consolidate all the costs associated with that program, and it doesn't make any difference what department it's in, what division it's in, what cost center it's in. Um, I can get all the way down to the granular level of what type of it, uh, spend category it is inside that program for you. Um, grants, we used to keep on an Excel spreadsheet. So we used to put a grant, 
be it a federal grant or a state grant, on an Excel spreadsheet, and we would track how much we're spending that grant down by Excel. We no longer have to do that with this new system. And donations, we used to keep by cost center, but now we keep it as a donation, and we can tell you how, what the expenses are associated with those. I hope that explains kind of what a module is. Yeah, so they give us better visibility. Absolutely. So why does us having, uh, we still need people to run them. So I'm worried about like, um, just in the future, um, you know, I'm thinking of structural deficit from our previous presentation. Like how can these modules and greater visibility help us can they help us predict structural deficits further out in advance? Um, how does that help us save money over time? So I think that the financial module can't help you predict, but adaptive, which is the project module, which is, excuse me, the forecasting module that we'll be working on, that can help you predict. So what we can do is we can put in our historical data into adaptive and do a predictive analysis that will come up with a better forecasting of both revenues and expenses. Okay. Does that answer your question? Um, I think so. So it helps us with forecasting in the event of economic downturn or some other, like a sales tax downturn. Um, I, I have an example that might be helpful as well. Um, so these same FTEs no longer needing state spreadsheets and instead being able to implement some of these modules, they are able to look further upstream in the expenditure process to lock down some of these budgets sooner, which reduces the risk of overspending. Oh. So it's the same people but doing higher value work. Uh, you might remember some examples from budget amendments the last couple of years where unfortunately expenses exceeded the budget and essentially the council was asked to reimburse or backfill. These additional transparency and accountability tools should reduce the risk and the incidences happening like that. Councilwoman Young? Yeah, so experience with these types of systems and so there's another piece to it that I'd add which is that by moving to a more systemized approach where you can tie the dollars directly to where they're intended to be spent it's not just a real-time transparency thing but it's also preventative of potential um, issues you could run into if you didn't have that type of constrained system so easy example would be if the person who's running the grant spreadsheet gets a better job offer and leaves and then the city's like I don't know where any of the money is like related to that like that's something where it would cost us quite a bit in resources so we're trying to be like preventative within that space which I appreciate I do also appreciate the fact that you know I think sometimes we think oh technology is going to allow us to decrease FTEs when for the most part it usually keeps it the same in terms of needs related to the administration of the program but I think Ben provided a really great example of where we're getting higher value work out of those individuals that ultimately helps to improve the internal controls that we're operating within so I appreciate that I will say I have one question slash future request related to the modules and the intent for zero based budgeting I would love to, in a future sense, have a conversation around what measures we're using to be able to determine if a program is successful. Because I think that is one of the key components of zero-based budgeting, is that you have to be able to show why you're continuing a program and what metric you've tied to that. Um, and I would hope that this type of a system leads us to more of those conversations. Agree. Councilman Dugan. Thank you very much, and thank you for that explanation on the the, uh, the improvements that we're making through the technology and, and using Workday and the ERP system and, and going to a zero-based budget. But I, I would still challenge you on the fact that because it is more efficient in that use, we should see a reduction somewhere on some FTEs because back to the fence, if it takes you 40 hours to do this one spreadsheet and keep track of it, and now it takes you two hours or less than that, then you should see some type of reduction. Now you do have to have different levels and different uh, skills 
but there should still be a I would say at some point when we hit that maturity level I, I can see that you need it now but at some point there's gonna be a maturity level that we can see a reduction in headcount and now that's always difficult to do um, but it's always uh, good business practice to look at your headcount and make sure that we actually have people that are actually performing that value that we want them because that's why that's why we improve the efficiencies and in the labor in, in the manufacturing world you improve your efficiencies so you can reduce uh, FTEs but also produce more at the same level so you continue to make more then you can add more people as you make more money I think what product. I would say is I agree with you, but I think it's a reallocation of some of our positions. And I'll give you an example. Um, we had two accounts payable individuals in the finance department. We reclassed one to help be a financial analyst because we didn't need to. We only needed one. And somebody else could back up. But the business system analysts, these are positions that we've never had to deal with. This is the technical side of stuff that usually, right, someone else takes care of, right? But because the system is so um, finance-centric, it is really intended for us to take care of it, right? We are the ones that have to take care of it. We are the ones that have to maintain it. We are the ones that have to do the training and the job aids. And because it's so much more complex, that's the difference in the um, level of individual that we need to take care of this system. Yeah, it, it may not be in your department that you could see a reduction in uh, headcounts. It would be in the uh, downstream departments that no longer need the three analysts doing something. They only need two because the technology at your level, they may still be the same requirement, but downstream, there may not be the same needs. Great. That's right. That, I'm, I'm, that, I'm looking at it as FTEs for the city, not FTEs for the finance department. That's a good point. Thank you, council member. Uh, I uh, thank you for, I mean, I know it took years to, to get to this place. So it's very exciting to see this, uh, this uh, zero budget budgeting uh, tool coming to online. I, uh, I'm very excited to, for you to be able to see uh, how much a program costs uh, and costs that were not ever thought about before. Uh, you know, an employee going to check on something related to a, a given uh, a given project that was not tracked uh, by by that. So that that to, to us give us uh, a better snapshot shot a snapshot of the of the true costs, which I, I potentially some the city probably was absorbing some of those costs in other ways. Uh, so the saving, I think we're going to see it by efficiency. Uh, and uh, especially, uh, I think we're probably going to see it on grants uh, because we potentially were not necessarily tracking all the unrelated costs to a grant. Uh, and we, will we were absorbing those costs in some other ways. Uh, so hopefully this will give us a better snapshot of that. I. I'm very excited to see more of this. Uh, and I do have a question, uh, well, two. Uh, one of those is related to programs, uh, to software uh, like Workday that is being used by multiple departments. How How is that track, for example, uh, it, it, the cost of the tool uh, within uh, the different departments or the different projects? Are, are those bigger tools also separated themselves into the different cost. Uh, so, you know, when I'm budgeting other pieces of, uh, you know, what I do on, on, uh, on my the other job, um, I try to divide or try to calculate how much of that ongoing cost relates to that one project that has a beginning and an end. Um, but that's for me to understand uh, if I can uh, pay for those that software and is is worth for me or not? So I wonder if some of those bigger tools are also, in, uh, or it's just cost of doing business. Uh, I'm I'm just curious about that one thing. And then the second thing you mentioned that the airport and public utilities are not using uh, zero, uh, you know, this, this new budget system. And is that is there a reasoning for that? And if there is a plan for them to join in into this? Yep, so they're going to join this next fiscal year. So both of them are on board. Um, both of them, they run a pro, um, program priority-based budgeting pretty close now, so I don't think it's going to be a huge transition for them. 
And then on your first question, um, yeah, I think it's interesting when you when you say that. So I think that one of the things that is very unique about Workday, well, okay, in my experience has been very unique about Workday is that we associate a cost center with say a division, right? So revenue and operations used to be a cost center and that cost center was only directly associated with a specific fund, the general fund. Lisa's cost center now can float to any fund. It is not tied directly to the general fund. She could, she could charge expenses to the grant fund or she could charge expenses to CIP. And we could see based on her cost center, based on this program, how many funds, funds she has actually charged her expenditures to by say, um, I don't know, let's use sales tax, right? So sales tax, how much time has she spent inside of these other funds for sales tax, the program sales tax? And sales tax is probably a bad example. Homelessness is a probably a better example, right? That how much her cost center is being charged to all of these funds, but what it's going to be in total with homelessness. Does, does that help? Okay. Thank you. That's amazing. I think you're clear to move forward. <laughs> okay. Um, so the last, the second to last request is a grant analyst. Uh, last year you gave us a half FTE. It's been hard to fill this position. Um, so I'm requesting a full FTE with this position. Um, one of the reasons that, that we really need this position is we only have two in the for the entire city besides um, police, we have two grant program coordinators. They're the ones that write the grants, they're the ones that develop the budgets, all of that. So we have two and they both live in the finance department. If one of them goes on vacation or becomes sick or something happens, um, that leaves one to manage all the grants inside Salt Lake City. Um, I have on several occasions had my grant um, um, coordinators cancel vacation time so that they could go on, so that they could get a grant completed, been sick, worked weekends, and I really need that redundancy inside this area so that we don't have to worry about that. And just like Council Member Young said, if one of them left and we did have one leave, it put the entire burden on one individual. And so an analyst prospects, writes, and tracks grants? They will write, and the biggest thing they're going to do is they're going to sit between both and understand what grants they're doing between both individuals so they can pick up where this grant coordinator lives up, um, left off or this grant coordinator left off. Councilwoman Young? As a follow-up question, I'd just be interested in the total value of the grants portfolio at any given time. That would be helpful in terms of assessing the FT cost. Oh, absolutely. We have that. Great. Thank you. Uh -huh. Councilman Lovis Chavez, did I see you? And then, then the last one is just professional development. It was a one-time and we've, we're requesting it to be ongoing um, with all these new systems. We need professional development. I know last year you gave me a little bit of funding, but with three new systems coming on, um, we will need professional development in those areas as well. Next slide, please. And then this is just the scoring from our department based on the matrix that I spoke about earlier today. Council, any questions? Um, I saw in the staff report that we are uh, going to have a 30% decrease in internal auditing. Can you? <laughs> pull it back up. It's on page four of the staff report. That is probably a move 
Okay. So internal audit used to be internal audit and financial analysis. We have made internal audit, internal audit standalone by itself. And the financial analysis is now under Lisa and Andrew. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. He had I'm me sorry. scared there. I'm like, <laughs> I'm glad to see like you were reacting. Like if I know that I'm like a little excitable, but if you're reacting like that, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm on the right path. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Do we have everyone we need for the resident survey results? We do? Okay. So then, Council, are you okay to keep chugging along? We're, we're ahead of schedule, but I'm okay to keep going if you are. Let's go. All right. So then let's move on to an informational briefing for about the 2024 resident survey results. Kira Luke, Council Policy Analyst, is joining us virtually. Haley Leak from IMS. Liz Bueller, the Director of Innovation and Project Management from IMS. Scott Riding from Y2 Analytics. And Tatiana Gilchrist from Y2 Analytics will be joining us at the table. Kira, I'll turn the time over to you. All right, I'll just kick us off with a little bit of context while everybody's getting settled. Um, for years, the city has conducted a survey just to keep a sense of constituent perspectives on things like the quality of life in the city, city services, new initiatives, and how accessible and helpful the information and the support we're providing are. The survey is conducted approximately every two years, but there has been some variation in that over time. Um, a lot of work goes into formulating questions that continue to gather relevant data points so we can track changes throughout the years, while also evolving each survey to capture perspectives on new programs or This year, uh, the survey outreach included a shift from telephone and mail to mail only, so we saw a significant decrease in the responses. It was also planned and conducted with much tighter than usual deadlines so it would be available in time for the insights here to inform the annual budget deliberations. So we're excited that we've got this right now when the budget's getting kicked off. Um, the innovation and project management team leads a working group to coordinate the survey, and they've been incredibly helpful discussing the lessons we've learned this year and brainstorming the next steps to refine the process. So representatives from the innovation and project management team are here and the YP analytics to discuss the methodology and conclusions from this year's survey. This is also going to be a great opportunity if council members have specific questions about results from your own districts. Um, if you want to request that data that we can send to you later. And if we have time, staff would love any feedback that council has to inform the working groups planning for the next survey. I'll hand it over to Haley from there. Haley and Elizabeth. Thanks, Kara. I think we got most of what you said, but we might need to uh, text you. <laughs> the sound kind of went a little wonky at the end there, but we'll turn it over to those of you in the room now. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Haley Lee. I'm the innovation team lead on the innovation and project management team in IMS. We have Tatiana and Scott from Y2 Analytics and Elizabeth Bueller, the uh, Director of Innovation Project Management in IMS. Um, so here, today we're here to discuss the results of the 2024 biannual survey. Uh, the agenda does note that we're discussing the residential panel survey, but those are actually different surveys. So the biannual survey is to gauge uh, changes in quality life over time and households are randomly selected. Um, whereas the panel survey participants are also randomly selected, but then they opt in to participate in two, uh, like two to three surveys per year on specific topics and timely civil, uh, civic matters. So we're here to discuss the biannual survey um, and also share some goals, uh, some future goals from the survey committee. Our goal is really to ensure that surveys act accurately reflect our diverse population of Salt Lake City and we're effectively using this data to inform policy and decision making. Um, so I quickly, before I turn the time over to Y2 Analytics, want to briefly outline the survey committee's strategic direction and some goals we have um, for the uh, coming year. So the innovation and project management team is excited to provide uh, the survey committee, which is compi um, comprised of senior leadership from the mayor's office, council, um, as well as dire the Director of Communications and Engagement and the Innovation Team. 
Um, so we provide support and guidance to ensure that research objectives and timelines are met. Um, our meetings are scheduled monthly, which will really help improve our survey inclusivity and response rates and also ensure that we're able to meet future deadlines more effectively. We also want to make sure that future surveys reflect what the council and mayor want to know about the city. Um, we also want to help constituents feel more comfortable participating in these surveys. Um, and we're also dedicated to making bringing back phone um, interviews just to make sure our surveys are more inclusive. Uh, so during a, la a recent uh, survey committee uh, meeting, we discussed the following improvements we'd like to make. Um, as mentioned, utilizing phone interviews again to explore um, and explore if there's a texting option. We also want to establish a timeline that guarantees that surveys are open for at least three to four weeks um, and also give enough time for council and mayor to provide feedback on any um, new questions. Uh, we also want to explore the relevance of the biannual survey to see how we use that historical data and also assess the value of the current format and questions to see if it's meeting our current needs. We also want to make sure that our sample is representative of the city and explore more of how data is weighed. Um, our goal is also to use the panel survey more frequently. May I interrupt and very quickly? Are you, uh, are you, uh, are those slides no. that you're presenting? No, oh, this no, okay. is, so we're, de I'm deep diving into our city survey committee. Um, this is kind of a newer committee. Um, we assembled it maybe a couple months ago and we have new representation um, from mayor and um, council on it. So these are our goals and how to improve future surveys. No worries, thank you. Yeah, and so just wrapping up, um, we, our goal is to increase participation and representation of our constituents. We wanna be more transparent and um, provide more engagement around it. We know that we need to in introduce more language into the invitation letter to explain what the survey is. Um, we will continue to use plain language to ensure the survey um, is accessible. And we also need to do more engagement around it, um, showing how the survey um, results are utilized by the city. Um, so yeah, I will turn the time over to Y2 Analytics to discuss results. Just one other, just one question. You said language, but you, are you talking about just how it's written, but not uh, by like in Spanish? Yeah. So the both. all surveys are translated in English and Spanish, but we just want to make sure that um, survey questions, the invitation letter, any ad additional engagement around the survey is um, straightforward. And right. Definitely. Right. Right. Thank you. Hi, Council. It's very nice to be here. I'm Scott Riding, the managing partner of Y2 Analytics. Tatiana Gilchrist, who's one of our directors of research, will also help brief today. Um, our job today is to brief you on the results, but also to answer questions, so feel free to stop us. Uh, wanted to start with methodology. So in the introduction, the survey team has been talking about some constraints on this year's survey. Part of our job as a scientific survey firm is to minimize error, right? And so our goal, if it were possible to get every citizen in, uh, and resident in the city um, to, to respond to surveys, we would. Uh, that's impossible, unfortunately. And so what we're trying to do is construct a sample that has, um, that reflects an average that would be close to that census, if we were able to do a census of the city, uh, within a margin of error that's acceptable. Okay, and there are two ways we go about that. One is on the sampling frame on the front end, which is how do we get a hold of people? And then the second is on the back end, we have statistical balancing techniques we, we use when we see non-response in certain areas or in certain demographics to try and balance things out. Our gold standard in a survey like this is the U.S. Census. Um, the U.S. Census, uh, from a statistical standpoint, is the most comprehensive attempt to quantify the, both the demographics and the uh, geographics of the city. And so that becomes our gold standard. So when we make statistical adjustments, it's toward that census. Um, uh, I can answer some basic questions about the census. We, we know a lot of friends over there, um, but if, uh, uh, so happy to do that. Beyond that, I'll probably have to punt questions about the census um, to that department, okay? So just so you know, that's the case. So as we go through the demographics of the survey, um, we'll compare them to the answers to both the American Community Survey, which is a census product, as well as the, biannual, uh, the bi-decennial census, to show kind of where our survey aligns and where we're, where we're off, okay? So if there's any questions about representativeness, we'll have them. So next slide. Oh, yeah. Next slide. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, next slide, actually, that's just the title slide. Okay, so methodology. Uh, we sample 10,000 households from a list of residents gathered from a USPS residential address database. It's what we call an address-based sample. Um, this is at odds with other sampling frames that you may have seen, for example, in a political context. A political campaign will use a registered voters list, which is their target population who's likely to vote. In a uh, survey like this, we want to know from people who live here, not just those who vote. And so we do um, residential addresses. And the sampling methodology is designed to account for uh, um, historical non-response rates across the city. So there are sections of the city that historically have been less likely to respond. And so we will oversample those areas in an attempt to get more responses. Historically, that has gotten us close. In this year's sample, because of a smaller time frame, um, there, uh, in districts one and two, there are fewer responses, and we've done some statistical adjustments to account for that on the back end. We had 653 households that participated. This is run between March 28th and April 7th, um, and I've already mentioned a lot of this stuff about the census. Just as a note, okay, so because of this sample size, our margin of error across all of our estimates is 3.8 percentage points. Just means that if we were able to do a census and got everyone's answers, our numbers we estimate would be, be within three percentage points, okay? That's kind of the, the margin of error on this survey. Okay, next slide. Some overall comparisons for demographics. So there's no question on residency on the US Census, but um, here's a kind of a, a distribution of residency for our responses. There's kind of a bimodal distribution, we call it basically we have a lot of people who are new to the city and then a lot of people who have been here for a very long time. Um, for children and households, 85% of our respondents said they didn't have children. It's actually very close to the census numbers that we don't have here, which are around 17% of households in Salt Lake City saying that there are children in the home. Home ownership on the census, it's 48% say they own uh, a property in the city. On our survey, we're about 48%. Um, next slide. Age-wise, we're very, very close. We line up across almost every age category. Gender-wise, what's different, the U.S. Census has very constrained gender categories because of it's kind of the historical trend line on that. And so um, we're, we're only off, I think, because we offer a more diverse set of categories to our respondents. Um, ethnicity is also a complicated thing on the census. The, the census asks about seven different ethnicity questions. Um, uh, some of which, uh, for historical reasons, don't align with modern views of how ethnicity is, is constructed. And so in our survey, it's a little bit more compact. Um, but for some combined categories, kind of our, our BIPOC group category, which is a co combination of questions, is about 23%, which does line up with the census. Same with marital status. Next slide. Um, employment, education, then income. Income is a complicated one. Our survey comes back a little bit higher than the census for income. I will note that on the census numbers, it's a four-year running average. And because of inflation over the last four years, the numbers are lagging in our view. So for example, four years ago, the median household income in this county was $70,000. Whereas um, if we just look at what that means in today's dollars, it would be closer to $92,000, okay? so. Some, some reasons for some deviations there. Overall, our statistical team feels comfortable with these numbers. Um, we'll note as we get to the geography on the next slide that there's some geographic patterns to responses. These are um, pretty, pretty much in line with what's been the history. Um, historically, we've had a little bit more time and we've worked and been able to send out additional invitations in areas where we had lower response rates. Not having that time in this round, what our team has done is constructed what are called statistical weights. Okay, so it's a balancing technique. Essentially, we've taken the people that responded in districts one and two, we have upweighted them to ensure that those districts have equal representation in the overall numbers for, for the city as a whole. Okay, but uh, as was mentioned earlier, part of our priorities for future years is to continue to address kind of non-response in those districts, whether it's an awareness issue or whether it's a, a mode issue is something that we're exploring. Okay. Can I ask quickly? Please. How did you calculate the weight? Yeah, so this is a, a, a pretty common question. I, um, it's an algorithm that is fairly complex, but I can describe it simply, which is imagine that there were 100 people in this room and we should have 10, well, it, Imagine there are 70 people in this room and we should have 10 from every district, but instead we have maybe 12 from one district and three from another. What we would do is say, okay, you guys from your districts get to, get to groups together. And now for those who are underrepresented, your vote counts for a little bit more 
than those that are overrepresented. And so individual respondents are assigned a weight that's above or below one, and then all estimates are multiplied by that weight. So mathematically what ends up happening is we weight up underrepresented areas, we weight down overrepresented areas. As a result, the final numbers are equivalent Did across. we see, and maybe I'm jumping ahead, did we see the non-response bias in District 1 and 2 and nowhere else? Uh, it is, relatively speaking, yes. Yeah, yeah, that is the right answer, yeah. And that has been the case for many years. Um, and we have, we've been able to address it in the past by doing extra invitations in those areas, but it's because we had extra time uh, for this particular round, we ran out of time. So instead we'd, we dress on the back end. So usually we try and address on the front and back end. So front end on invitations, mode changes, right? Language options. This time we address on the back end with statistical weighting. So would it be accurate to say that what we're actually saying is enough time to conduct the survey is actually not enough time if two-sevenths of the city require more time in order to engage them in ways that are meaningful to them. I'm not one for accommodations. I'm for universal design where my people don't feel like they are uh, the, the asterisk all the time. So maybe it just needs to be a policy change that we need more time to execute the survey and to offer fidelity to the model. And if I could interrupt, sorry, just to answer that, um, I want to own on our behalf that we requested that the survey be done in a shorter amount of time with the hope that the person um, the information that you could get from the survey would be helpful in your budget deliberations. And so by the time the process started, we asked if they could work on a more expedited timeline. So for this year, that was a huge factor. And they um, really bent over backwards to try and meet that request. So we, the unintended consequence of that, unfortunately, was not having the time like he's describing to go back and do additional mailings and generate more respondents from the lower. Thank you for always being willing to own the place yeah. where we need to do better at count on council. I appreciate you. But and I think if, maybe we just need to mark this down in the future that that's not the time frame. In, in actuality, every district was lower compared to really, but, but not district proportionally, one. however, but, yeah, but if you look at your exactly. numbers proportional to the total responses yeah. versus this year, they actually track almost exactly with total responses. The district two is the one that tracks significantly oh, yeah. exactly. lower. Exactly. Mine, my district actually tracks kind of in corollary with the total responses as well. But yeah, and district five was less than 50% and district seven was less than 50% too. But, but the respondents were a, a little over 50% from the year before. We were at, we're about 60, so it was about 1,000 the years before, and now we have about 600 and change. Yeah. So for me to come in at 50% is a margin of error. But district two, D you're right. Two is an abuse way, right now. We are, exactly. there's no waiting that I feel confident yeah, in absolutely. for district, district two. two. Yeah. Thank you. And we want to address it up front because it's going to be a factor in these. Like we mentioned, on the back end, statistically, we've done what we can to um, ensure that those who did respond to District 2, that those responses are in proportion to the population of the district to the city as a whole. So from that standpoint, we feel confident. But to your point, in the future, more work on the front end would help. So methodological concerns aside, I'm going to turn the time to um, Tatiana to address kind of the results. Thank you, Scotty. Um, so I am going to start by reviewing our objectives and key takeaways. So feel free to skip forward two slides. Oh, yep. Sorry. I'll be. <laughs> okay. I will be loud. Um, so we'll start just by reviewing kind of our five key takeaways here, and then we'll deep dive into the results a little bit more. So the number one thing is res residents of Salt Lake City generally report a high quality of life. So we ask them to rate their quality of life on a scale from zero to 100. And the average quality of life rating right now sits about 72, which is three points higher than last year's evaluation. Um, that was from a set of email panelists, to be clear. Um, quality of life is highest in districts five and six with a 76 out of 100. Both. 59 percent of residents also say the city is headed in the right direction and 45 percent believe that their city tax dollars are well spent. SLC constituents rate social workers golf course uh, maintenance well so when we ask them um, a list of city services that they value those are generally the most highly rated. 9-11 dispatch and fire and paramedics are also highly rated. Um, 
Homeless engagement and street maintenance are two of the lowest rated services right now. Um, and given the opportunity to fund city services, residents are the most likely to give money to street and road surface maintenance, as well as city parks and open spaces. Uh, many residents believe that their neighborhoods are walkable and well connected, so they tend to express positive perceptions of their neighborhood's access to key amenities like parks, shopping, and parking. Um, the, th the thing that residents most enjoy about the city are its restaurants, um, and nearly 60% of residents prefer to eat at restaurants in the city over anywhere else. As a personal note, my husband and I just moved back to this area from Indiana, and this is like our favorite part of <laughs> living back here is the food accessibility and, and the options that are here. Um, the police are generally well trusted uh, while residents support the initiative initiative to have social workers handle various emergencies um, so 63 percent trust the police a great deal or a moderate amount and almost 90 percent of residents believe that law enforcement should build relationships with community members um, 92 percent of residents believe that social workers should be dispatched for various emergencies um, and then the vast majority who believe this express confidence in social workers' specialized training to be able to handle these situations. Um, a slight majority of residents express satisfaction with, the, with contacting the city. So of those who have reached out in the last, um, I believe, six months, we'll, we will get to that <laughs> and confirm that, 54% said they were satisfied with the response that they received. Um, most who did contact the city did so over the phone, and residents would prefer to contact the city through the phone or via email. They would also prefer to receive news or updates from the city by email, um, although many currently do not. We tend to see this in most cities where um, the council and the city will say, well, we have these options for emails and people are just unaware of them. So that's something that we have noted here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the depth of our slides. So if we could skip ahead to the slide that says overall quality of life in Salt Lake. Yep, perfect, thank you so much. So just again to review the overall quality of life in Salt Lake City sits so about 72. This has not changed super significantly from prior waves. The trend is pretty uh, consistent. It is up three points from 2023. And uh, another important note is very, very few rate their quality of life as below 50. When we look at this by council district, the averages are high across all districts, again with districts five and six seeing the highest averages at 76 there. When, oh, I'm so sorry, next slide. We're on um, less than half say their tax, tax dollars are well spent. So one more. Perfect, thank you. Um, so, 45% of respondents said that the service they received for their tax dollar was good or excellent, um, while 55% say that the service was fair or poor. This is pretty consistent with how they rated it in 2023. Um, and Scotty brought, brought up an excellent point earlier that this generally correlates with rises in inflation um, where people might not be perceiving the value of their dollar in most places very well, and that translates to responding to tax um, value in the city um, uh, question on that yeah um, does how does this compare to other cities as well like our size do um, can you do you know yeah Scotty could you yeah I can jump in so we have uh, uh, dozens of city clients and they're all seeing this um, I'm not just seeing it with cities so we do a lot of work with banks Banks are seeing this kind of re uh, reaction as well. Basically, anyone who's either a taxing entity or a storage facility for money has seen satisfaction with their services or overall brand value drop ever since the value of money has dropped. It's unfair, but that is the, that is the sentiment across the board. Well, I was also wondering if um, with a rise in like homelessness in all major cities if that correlates at all like if people feel like are conf are are putting those two on top of each other and seeing an increase in homelessness because that was that was i think one of the areas that they said that they felt like the city was 
having the least impact or something. I don't remember how it was phrased, but it was one of the first part. Sure. So I wonder if that's connected at all. It's a very good question. I don't know that we've done analysis trying to connect views on homelessness towards satisfaction with taxation, but it's a good question and one that we can follow up on. Um, I guess I hesitate to speculate. Yeah. The time frames do 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 line up in in some cases. Uh, but there I guess it also lines up with inflation in ways that we have seen direct correlation. So that's why I'm, I'm careful to speculate, but we can do the analysis. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Okay, let's move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So we're going to review the top 10 rated city services. This is asked on a scale of one to seven. So um, not one to 10, as one might assume. So keep that in mind here. The top rated services are um, social workers, the city golf courses, 9-11 and dispatch, fire and paramedics and park rangers. Um, I will note that the emergency mental health services, which is a fairly new initiative, is rated very highly as well. Um, which is wonderful to see. People also really love the library, the website, garbage pickup, and um, the sewer system here. When we dive into the bottom rated city services, um, we see that homeless engagement and response team and street maintenance are the lowest rated. Um, we also see public parking, sidewalk maintenance, homeless services as things that people are kind of rating um, mid tier because our scale is one to seven here. The police department is rated at a five, which I would still say. Oh, so sorry. Next slide. I apologize. Yep, that's great. Um, the police department is rated at a five, which is still quite high from a scale of one to seven. And the same with bike lane availability. So now we're going to jump into neighborhoods and initiatives. So if we could skip forward two slides, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so this uh, was a series of questions that asked residents how much they agree or disagree with various aspects of their neighborhood. Um, and this is just kind of some everyday life metrics. So most people think that their neighborhoods are walkable and connected and they like the way that their neighborhood looks. Um, some areas where people might feel less positively about their neighborhoods are um, in relation to schools, um, getting enough attention from the city and then seeing improvements since they have moved into that neighborhood. I will note though that all of the um, options that we asked about that we have asked about before have improved since 2023. So that is great to see. And we'll move to the next slide here. So this is asking about um, neighborhoods and accessibility. So most people feel that their neighborhoods are accessible, accessible to public lands. They can do most of their food shopping in their neighborhood. They are safe. Um, their neighborhood has good transit and the right mix of businesses and housing. Again, all of the things that we have been able to trend from the prior year have increased as well. Next slide. Um, residents feel safer during the day. I feel like that's a pretty uh, common thing to see here when we asked if they feel uh, safe walking alone in their neighborhood or in downtown, downtown Salt Lake. Most people said they feel safe everywhere, but feel the safest in their own neighborhood during the day. We'll move on to the next slide. So this slide uh, is talking about aspects of downtown Salt Lake City that residents like. Um, like we noted earlier, restaurants and food are really highly rated in Salt Lake and people tend to prefer the restaurants and food options here over anywhere else. Um, people are also satisfied with arts and performances, events and festivals, parks and open spaces, et cetera. Um, and many people find these options preferable in Salt Lake City. I will note that one or two places where they might prefer to go elsewhere are for parks and open spaces and bike ability. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We're gonna skip ahead um, to the family focus section. So um, I'll give a second to get through to that. So close, perfect. Okay, so the next slide on that, awesome. 
So this is a new question that we asked this year, um, and we wanted to evaluate whether or not residents were planning on having children in Salt Lake, and if they were not, what was preventing them from doing so. So about 62% of residents do not plan on having children while living in Salt Lake, and many of these just don't plan on having kids at all, so it has nothing to do with the city itself. Um, another 39% say that they're concerned about air quality in Salt Lake, and 37% are concerned with affordable housing options in Salt Lake. Um, those are the kind of the main reasons people are choosing not to have children. And we're going to dive into transportation and roads here. So if we could skip two slides. Perfect. Thank you. Um, residents tend to agree that transport should run better, but they also think that transit's pretty affordable. Um, and it can come at times that are convenient. So there are kind of a lot of mixed feelings about transportation in the city, um, mostly with people wanting to have more accessibility to it and, and maybe being frustrated with um, the timing or the location that transit is available. And we'll skip ahead to the next slide. Um, when residents were asked to describe the roads in the neighborhoods where they live, there were some mixed reviews. So many people think that the traffic is too fast, um, but they do think that their roads are well lit and they are safe for pedestrians. Fewer people think they're safe for cyclists, but it's still over 50% of residents. Um, and again, over 50% of residents think that their roads are well maintained where they live. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see how residents feel about roads around the city. Um, the city roads are generally seen as less maintained than their neighborhood roads. Again, you'll see that people think traffic is too fast, um, that the roads are safe for pedestrians around the city, um, and that they are well lit, but maybe that there's less, less well maintained than their own roads. Now we'll dive into parks and open space here. I'll just touch on this very quickly. Um, so we'll skip ahead to the slide that says residents want parks in downtown. Awesome. So uh, we asked residents where they like to be outside and then where they would like to see more parks. So residents like to be outside in Sugar House primarily and then kind of the common places, City Creek Canyon, Avenues, downtown Salt Lake, et cetera. Um, but the places where residents were most likely, would most like to see parks are in downtown Salt Lake City and in Sugar House. If we could move forward two slides. We'll finish up with a communications review quickly here. Um, so just over half of city responses are satisfactory to those who have reached out to the city. Um, so only 42% of residents contacted the city in the last year. Um, and then 54% of those residents were satisfied with the city's response. And if we jump to the next slide, uh, we asked how residents are seeing um, social media from Salt Lake City, if they are. The two most common platforms for receiving information about the city are on X, formerly known as Twitter, and Nextdoor. Um, the usefulness of these posts is, is middling, so about 55% say that they're somewhat useful. Um, and then we'll move to the next slide here. We also asked about community councils and the value of those for residents. Um, as is probably expected, only about 14% say that they have attended a community council meeting. Um, and many of those people have attended only once uh, or up to a few times. <laughs> is this too high, too low? <laughs> too low. OK. Um, so this is this was our last slide. So that that is all the information we have for you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we are open to any questions you may have. Thank you, Council. Councilwoman Young. Yes. Um, so thank you for this information. Um, as a follow up, I'm curious if it's possible to get a, a summary of this same data, but related to each of our districts. Um, I know I'd be interested. I would assume the other council members might be as well, just to kind of have an understanding of if there's a difference of priority or key issues that we're seeing within our districts to be able to respond. Yeah, we can provide a top line report that shows the breakouts by council district. That'd be great. So Thank that. you. Yeah, of course. Council members, any additional questions? Okay, so we're in agreement that we need more time to do this next time we do it, but thank you.
Madam Chair, Thank you. Um, on that timing piece, was it is it just that we need to let them know sooner to get started or what? It feels like they need op the opportunity to choose a methodology that's going to compensate for the various ways people need to respond and not to be forced into the quickest modalities for gathering feedback. Is that accurate? And if I may respond to that, and I'm going to move the mic away, um, we we pl we are already planning next year's survey. So one, you will have it in time for your budget deliberations, but also that we start the process sooner. We also feel we have an option to bring back the phone, so we think that'll also help uh, as well. So we really think we'll have get back to the same respond rate as we did in previous years next year. I would advocate for increased in District 1 and 2, even above those previous baselines. Uh, Madam Chair, but are you also seeing this across the uh, multiple cities? Because I, I, when you're running for a campaign, you do a lot of uh, outreach in all different venues, and you realize that people are just inundated with information, and they don't see anybody tracking certain things just because they, they're flooded. And I just look at it, too. When I go to my Google account, I hit the delete on so many things and like why am i getting these things because i never even open them but i almost reluctant to open or just unsubscribe them by just go to delete so are you are you seeing that across the board or because i can't imagine we're being we're any different from any city our sides across the united states yeah so i guess relative comparisons for the city are year over year we are down this year and that i think we've explained that but across um, all market research response rates are down um, it's something that the industry has addressed in a lot of ways. We used to just call random phone numbers and people would respond. Response rates when I started in the industry were 50% and have dropped down below 10%. Um, luckily, the people, the 10% who do respond seem to be fairly good, uh, relatively representative of those who don't. So it's not like there is an, a motivation to respond that is related to the topic of the survey in most cases, although that can be different in certain city policy surveys, which we account for. Um, but to your point, we're always innovating. So um, one of the modes that we've brought up is uh, there, there's texting. Almost every text is read. And so one of the invitation methods that we found a lot of value in and for some of our other clients is something called text to web, where an invitation goes out over a text message and they're driven to the survey that way. We still have to manage random sampling, which is a key component of it. But when we randomly sample and do invitations across multiple modes with multiple touches in areas that need more time, then it tends to work out. So, yeah. Madam Chair. Okay, concise, we are now a concise. minute to pass. Concise. I, uh, the, um, obviously, as we're saying, District 2, uh, I would love to see more engagement from, from my part of town. Um, I, I wonder, um, related to my district and how many uh, in my district being, I mean, being the most diverse part of town with the most amount of languages and also with arguably probably the most amount of jobs uh, per capita uh, and I, I wonder how we are accounting for all of these um, dif different variables uh, and you know we have some of the largest communities uh, of non-English speaking in my district so uh, are we uh, and I'm not only talking about Spanish right I'm, I'm talking about a, a lot of more languages so I, I wonder if in the future uh, if we are looking into uh, capturing some of this feedback uh, from them in other languages uh, and accounting for the, 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 you know, the constraints of having multiple jobs uh, uh, and those barriers uh, to, to get feedback. So I'll, I'll answer that backwards. <clears throat> On the second piece, what we find is in, in that community in particular, multi-touch, multiple modes, because what ends up happening with the survey is if we happen to catch someone at a good moment, at their time, otherwise not, right? And so for a community that's exceptionally busy and has more responsibilities, more obligations on their time, we have to uh, send more invitations. So time will help, mode changes will help. On the first question of language, we offer the survey in English and Spanish now, which uh, when we first took over this contract in 2015 was an addition to kind of the mode that was being done at the time. There was an analysis done at that time of like, wow, we have like 17 other languages we could offer it in, but none of them were even 1% of the city population at that time. And so I think a budget decision was made to say, hey, maybe not now, but let's reevaluate. And it's one that I'd be willing to reconsider. The disproportionate cost of translation is relative small so something we could look at thank you all right thank you all so much
With that, we will move on to some board appointments. And I don't think anyone is applying is being appointed to the same board. So we're going to do these all individually. So let's start with a uh, transportation advisory board. Miranda Bradshaw, are you here in person? Mm -hmm. Come on up, Miranda. So we typically ask um, appointees, yep, at the table here, just make sure the green light's on the microphone. We typically ask appointees to just give us a minute or two introduction, why you're interested in this position, yeah, a little bit about yourself. Is, Sorry, can you can you speak? Is the light it? green in front of you? On the is the green light turned on? There you now go. there's a green there light. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, my name is Miranda Bradshaw. I live in the Marmalade neighborhood with my partner Brianne and our dog Rocky. <laughs> I played volleyball for the University of Utah and afterward played uh, professionally in Europe, and that's where I fell in love with multimodal transportation. Uh, upon moving back to the United States a few years ago, I started working in the technology side of parking and transportation for municipalities, and I'm excited to bring my knowledge and enthusiasm for parking in particular to the Transportation Board. I love that. Council, any comments, concerns? Thank you so much for being willing to do this uh, and to serve your community this way. I love parking enthusiasts who have knowledge. That's exciting. Um, you don't need to be present, but you'll be on our next consent agenda. And after that, you'll actually be on a board. So thank you so much for being here. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, next we're going to go for an appointment to our sister city board with Stacy Adams. You know the you know the routine, yeah. Kind of <laughs> like this before. It's kind of fun. Just a minute or two about yourself and your interest in serving in this way. So my name is Stacy Adams. I live in the fabulous District Two with uh, Councilman Alejandro. I've lived in Salt Lake City for twenty plus years. Um, I love living here. I've been living on the West Side for nine and a half years. I am actually very very pleased and lucky to be able to serve the city as a consultant doing a lot of transportation, public engagement, and strategic communication work. So I get to work all over the city. Many of you know me because you call my project hotlines and send your constituents to them when there are issues. But I'm very proud to be able to live in this city and to represent my city. And just one thing I want you all to know, um, I work all over the state and sometimes across the country doing very similar work. And Salt Lake City, we hold up as a model for best practices when it comes to engagement. Sorry, I'm talking so fast because I'm nervous. Um, <clears throat> but we hold up the best practices that we use to do engagement in this city all over the country. And so for me, as someone who gets to help develop those for this city and then implement them and actually see them used in my community also, it just makes me really proud to be on this side of the table and, and on the side of Salt Lake City all the time, so. Thank you so much. Council, any comments? I just want to say, Stacy, I've seen you help so many businesses and constituents engage in process that's very difficult. Mm -hmm. We take it for granted. So I've seen the transformation of what public involvement looks like at a community level. I'm really excited to see you in this position and to serve your city. Thank you. Thank you. You are the best that Salt Lake City can offer uh, and to represent us and to uh, really, uh, you know, expand uh, our visibility and our connection to the world. I'm very excited for you joining. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm excited to be your partner in this. Thanks very much for considering me. Thank you for lending your talents and your time to the city this way. You do also do not need to be here. You'll be on our next consent agenda. And thank you. All right. Thank you. Next, we will meet Natalie Moldover for appointment to the library board. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Natalie Moldover. I've been in Salt Lake City since 1994 when my company in Northern California moved me here. One of the things I was really excited about because I brought a four-year-old here is that library is open on a Sunday. Because in Northern California, with all of the budgetary things that were happening in the 1890s, there just wasn't. So, you know, as a working mom, I love to be able to bring my daughter to the now the Leonardo. Um, I've always lived in Salt Lake City, 
And one of the things that I mentioned when I, when I came in to speak with uh, Adam and Noah a couple of weeks ago is, you know, I have been a proud library patron since I grew up in New York City. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn, and I had my library card at eight, eight, age eight. And to see all of the innovations in library, you know, libraries today, it's really exciting for me to see that because it's no longer a shush environment, but it's an environment to kind of figure out how do we best serve um, all of the constituencies in Salt Lake City. So I'm really excited to be part of, of it, and I look forward to that, this opportunity. Thank you, Council. I'm really I'm sure. Go ahead. Thank you, Natalie, for, for uh, representing D6, but also for your passion with libraries. And I think Noel will be very happy to have you on the board. So Thank you, Dan. appreciate Thank it very you. much. And I think Councilmember Dugan and I would agree that having native New Yorkers here <laughs> working for the city is a really good thing for all of us. Yeah, so. good too. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for lending your time and talent. You don't have to be here. You'll be on a consent agenda, but thank you. And we look forward to your service. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. All right, next we'll talk about an appointment to the Arts Council Board. Gabrielle Huggins is online. I'm here, but I can't start my video for some reason. Just <laughs> very upsetting because it was on. Oh, can we see me? Oh no, so sad. I saw you just a second ago. I know, right? I saw myself when I got here as well, <laughs> and, then, and then it was gone. It says, oh, it says the host has stopped my video. Can we make her? There she is. There we go. All Hi. right. Hello. All right, Gabby, just a little bit about yourself, a minute or two, and why you're interested in service of this kind at the city. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Uh, my name is Gabriella Huggins. I go by Gabby. Um, I currently work as the executive director for Arch Access, which is a local nonprofit working to increase accessibility in the arts um, in the city um, through accessibility programming, programming that serves disabled artists to increase representation. And then also we do trainings for cultural institutions on how to make their programming more accessible. Um, I am a Salt Lake City native, grew up here on the west side in Rose Park. and. Um, I have the privilege of being a homeowner in Glendale, and I am really excited to serve on the Arts Council Board because I personally um, have benefited so much as a Salt Lake City resident from high quality arts programming. As a young person, it's been part of my trajectory um, into professional life, um, and it's a, it feels like a big honor and a big opportunity to be able to represent the West Side well on this Arts Council Board um, and to influence uh, what the arts look like in Salt Lake. Um, so. Yeah, I'm excited to grow also as a professional and, and see other boards. I'm running a small nonprofit and so learning how to run a board myself as well. So it's a sort of a symbiotic process, I hope, where I get to glean some information about how to, to run a board well so that we can do good work as a community. So that's why I'm interested in serving on this board. Thank you. Council? Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to see uh, West Side residents, uh, you know, joining our city uh, and joining their voices and their, their bringing their experiences and their power to the table. So thank you for joining. Um, if you all have not met Gabby, you have to meet her at a time right now where we're arguing over buildings that by their very architecture were our continue to be exclusive to patrons of the arts. Gabby's organization not only has been doing abilities-based inclusion th comprehensively throughout the arts, they run the most ridiculously amazing training for nonprofit professionals called Breaking Bar It's Breaking Barriers or Breaking Boundaries? Yeah, breaking barriers. barriers. Yeah. And it's in collaboration with Utah Arts and Museums. Having your voice, Gabby, like I'm, I'm so thrilled. We already have a great team over at the Arts Council that's concerned with making the arts not just vibrant, but vibrant for every Salt Laker. And I'm just so thrilled that you have volunteered any amount of your time and energy to help us with that. So thank you. You don't have to be here. You're going to be on a future consent agenda. And then once we approve that, then you are free to start. And I look forward to the ways you're going to shape us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to say on that point, like I appreciate arts museums and also organizations like the Arts Council for investing in the arts in this way. So breaking barriers is only possible because of folks like y'all. So totally happy to give back. Thanks, Gabby. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. All right. And now we're going to move on to an appointment to the Business Advisory Board with Bryce Wurzbaugh. Did I say that right? 
There you you go. did say it right, which is very uncommon. <laughs> well done. Um, well, yeah, Bryce Word Spa. Uh, I'm with the Suazo Business Center, so I've been starting up there. Sorry, I'm biting off my dog here. Um, uh, and I am a dog owner. I'm originally from uh, Logan, Utah, and moved down here to go to school and really just fell in love with the city um, and really want to give it back to it. And I've always really been in customer service and benefiting others and it's been really nice to move into the nonprofit side of things to really help others and, and not have you know other things at mind and so it's finding spouse has been just a blessing for me and you know it's really great to be a part of an organization that does give back and um, being part with the city and then helping our I mean, primarily the Latino population but also um, other populations that are underserved as well. Love doing, you know, all the outdoor stuff in Utah. Uh, big into that as well as sitting back, painting, and just relaxing. So, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much, Bryce. Council, any comments? We are all huge fans of Swazo here, and having a voice from Swazo on the business advisory board is going to be just a, a real bonus to all of us. So thank you so much for being willing to give your time and talents to the city. You'll be on a future consent agenda, and then we look forward to you joining the business advisory board. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we are tracking 10 minutes ahead. The next thing is the um, youth state of the city. Can we take a 10 minute break? Because I want to go potty and I don't want to miss anything they say. So instead of starting early, can we, can we take a, a quick break? Okay. Youth, youth, state of the city. We will be back for you, but as scheduled. All right. Thank you. We are now going to welcome up for our youth state of the city address. Uh, we have, first of all, Representative Angela Romero who is their senior, senior community program manager, Lisbeth Chavez-Diaz, who's the Youth City Teen Program Instructor, and then the Youth City participants today are Dia Omen? Omen? Omen. Oh, I, I always get at least one vowel in your name wrong. I apologize. Wild Violet Badger, Owen Hodgkinson, Shiv Parahar, Liam Mountain Malfa, and Lainey Hall. You all may come up to the table or take shifts as you see fit, but we are now your captive audience for 20 minutes. So I just wanted to make a small introduction. This is my first year um, being part of this group, and I could not be more happy about everything that this group of youth has been doing. They're very strong and opinionated and I love it. And they have lots to say. So I'm excited that they're here and we're ready to hear them talk. Okay, hi, I'm Dia. Um, I'm a senior at West High School. So this is the last time you have to hear from me. And I'm a constituent in District 2. For the past five years, I've been involved in YCG, and it's been an experience that's shaped my understanding of civic engagement and also strengthened my commitment to advocating for those around me. In recent times, we've, dis we've observed a troubling trend in Utah's legislative decisions, particularly those that strip away diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and impact the very fabric of our educational institutions. The new legislation that eliminates DEI programs in these settings isn't just disheartening, it's a direct challenge to our progress as a diverse and inclusive society. These programs are essential for fostering an environment where every student, regardless of their background, feels valued and supported. Moreover, the recent legislative changes around school safety emphasize a move towards heightened security measures without adequate input from those it affects most, us, the students. This top-down approach bypasses the critical insights that could be gleaned from student feedback, insights that are essential to crafting measures that genuinely safeguard our schools rather than merely making fortresses of them. As young citizens, we aren't just passive bystanders in this narrative. 
We're actively witnessing the erosion of our rights and the curtailing of our voices in places that are meant to nurture and empower us. The legislation that dismisses DEI initiatives and enforces arbitrarily rigid security measures in our schools doesn't protect us. It isolates and divides us. So tonight, we call on you, our city's leaders, to listen and to act because it's imperative that you recognize the urgency with which we want to counter these regressive actions. We must work together to restore and expand DEI programs, ensuring that every student, regardless of their background, feels valued, heard, and seen. We must ensure that the policies regarding our safety are shaped by those who walk the school hallways daily, not just by those who legislate from afar. So tonight, as we discuss the youth state of the city and our hopes for the future, we should reaffirm our commitment to the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because it's up to you all to listen and to act and to advocate for the well-being of, of, and rights of us and all the other students in our city um, so that we can build a community that truly reflects the values of respect, understanding, and justice. Thank you for giving us the platform to share our perspectives. My name is Wild Violet. I live in Council District 3 and I'm a sophomore this year. I have worked with YCG for two years now and this year we spent a lot of time on the Hill during the legislative session learning about different issues and bills that impact Salt Lake City. As someone who likes to be involved in government, there are a lot of issues that I care deeply about, especially when they affect young people. Education is one of these issues that was widely talked about during this legislative session, and there are a lot of changes being made that affect our school systems. For the second year in a row, the Utah legislature has passed a bill that undermines the identity of trans people, including students. A bill passed this legislative session prevents transgender people from using the bathroom of their choice in public buildings, including schools, under the guise of protecting children from dangerous people. I believe this is a vital issue. This will prevent students in public schools from expressing their identities and serves to further alienate an already marginalized community. Despite the law, the Salt Lake City School District is taking steps to make students feel safe. The actions taken are commendable, but it is saddening that steps are even needed in the first place. Regulating what bathroom people are legally allowed to go and use, in my opinion, is ridiculous. I don't think that it's the state's business what bathroom I choose to go into, and it's insane to find government facilities up to $10,000 when someone enters a certain bathroom. Another large issue that is affecting schools all over the state is the recent additions to the book banning law. The rise in censorship in education in general is a concerning trend, and the new changes to the law have made it so that if a book is banned in three school districts, it is banned throughout the state. This part of the law comes into effect in July and many books are likely to be banned throughout the state's schools. While I understand that some parents worry about what their kids are reading, banning books is not a good solution. It isn't the state's job to decide what kids read and don't read about. That's a discussion that should be reserved for a parent and their child. On top of that, most books that are being challenged in school districts are primarily about disenfranchised groups such as people of color and our LGBTQIA community. By banning these books, we are harming youth, silencing voices, and erasing history. The changes made cannot easily be reversed, but it is our duty as a city to do what we can to provide a safe environment for students to learn and make sure all students feel welcomed, heard, and understood. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Greetings. My name is Owen Hodgkinson. I'm a freshman from Highland High School and live in Council District 7. This is my first year in the program. Participating in YCG has been one of the highlights of my year, and this experience has provided me with lots of unique opportunities and exposure to the new and diverse ideas. I've gained a greater understanding of political processes and learned to voice my own opinions. One of my favorite musicians, John Lennon, once said, you won't get anything unless you have the vision to imagine it. YCG has really helped me to imagine a future where my voice is heard and my actions can make a difference. 
One of the topics that I have found inescapable this year has been the growing homelessness crisis here in Salt Lake City. During the school year, YCG has met in various locations downtown where I, met, where I witnessed this crisis firsthand. Homelessness is not caused by a single issue. It may be caused by unforeseen circumstances like unemployment, addiction, or mental illness. Different solutions addressing each challenge will be needed to make significant progress. Just as Salt Lake is not Utah's only city, it, can, it cannot be expected to have to face this problem on its own. It is our duty to work in collaboration with the state of Utah and other cities and countries to help those in need. Instead of pointing fingers and swapping blame, cities and government entities from across Utah need to come up with creative approaches to better serve the community members experiencing homelessness. Instead of ignoring the problem or trying to make financial excuses, we as a state need to prioritize assisting these individuals. However, though, I'd like to acknowledge Mayor Mendenhall's and the Salt Lake City Council's efforts to solve this issue. We have made significant progress as a city with our unsheltered population by starting Utah's first temporary micro-shelter community in collaboration with Switchpoint and the State Office of Homelessness Services. I believe this can be utilized in the future to create more comfortable and friendly environments for unsheltered individuals to get back on their feet. Unfortunately, access to housing isn't the only problem experienced people experiencing homelessness face. They and many other Utahns are experiencing hunger. One of our biggest projects this year was organizing Mayor Mendenhall's MLK Day of Service project in partnership with the Utah Food Bank. Helping with this project was a great opportunity to act and help those in need. Instead of just discussing it like a school assignment, we came together as a community to help those experiencing hunger by surpassing our fundraising goal of $1,000. For the Utah Food Bank, we want to thank everyone who supported us in reaching this goal, particularly Salt Lake City employees. This is a reminder to me that service to the community and the people is at the heart of what city leaders are here to do. Thank you, council members. My name is Shiv Parihar. I am from Council District 4, represented by the wonderful Eva Lopez Chavez. Although I attend high school at the Salt Lake Center for Science Education, where I'm a senior, uh, which happens to be the only high school west of I-15 and thus is in Council District 1. Alexis de Tocqueville, in his seminal meditation upon the New Republic, 1831's democracy in America, mused that the core of success of this nation's civic endeavor lie not in its ballot boxes, but in the congregations of New England, where the individualism that had fueled our revolution was constrained by the chains of communitarian morality and the ability to unite across community divides. Our country now has been plagued by a national crisis of isolation, of the hauling out of churches, libraries, and other third spaces that have offered places for our communities to thrive together, not separated. As a city uniquely rooted in a culture of civic religion, Salt Lake has defied this trend with a tri thriving system of libraries and the highest rate of church attendance in the nation. Where elsewhere buildings stand abandoned and churches emptied, our city is booming with new development and a community to match. The issue of homelessness cannot be solved by the city acting alone, as I know from my intimate acquaintance with it. But decisive action has mitigated the crisis to the best of our ability as a city, securing the right to shelter while protecting the right to public spaces free of crime and encampments. Our city's greatest triumph lies in slaying poverty as we pursue progress, and it must lie in the field of zoning. We have led the nation in deregulating the housing market, allowing for a supply of housing to meet our demand. And we must continue this corollary by separating our property tax revenues to uh, allocate a higher amount on the land values and the property values as opposed to a united rate uh, property tax. In the words of one of the great American Catholics, if a city isn't crying, it's dying. And as the old adage about families goes, uh, pardon me, I am proud to witness this focus our city has embarked upon an ownership-focused, family-friendly housing keep our city growing as a community and not merely a place to live. Uh, 
My name is Liam Mountain Lamalfa. I live in District Strix, Six, excuse me, and though I also attend Slixy, and I'm the founder of the Youth Coalition for Great Salt Lake. So I'm going to start with some statistics, and uh, I, if, if you're already familiar with them, I apologize, but we'll proceed from there. So the escalating levels of particulate matter in the air due to the shrinking Great Salt Lake pose a significant threat to all residents of Utah, particularly those grappling with homelessness. Preserving the lake is imperative, not only to safeguard air quality and public health, but for a multitude of other reasons. The economic vitality of the region relies heavily on the lake, generating up to $2.2 billion directly from various industries. Additionally, the flourishing ski industry, renowned for its greatest snow on earth, depends on the increased precipitation triggered by the lake's lake effect. This bolsters both recreational and economic interests. Furthermore, the ecological ramifications of a disappearing Great Salt Lake cannot be overstated, with over 10 million birds comprising 338 species in jeopardy of extinction. The loss of these vital species will undoubtedly set off a catastrophic domino effect, unleashing a trophic cascade that extends from our area outwards. The fact is, Salt Lake City will be located right smack dab in the middle of all of these problems. The economic downturn would cost us jobs close to home. The ripple effect throughout the ecosystem would cause instability that will lower the quality of life in the valley. Most of all, Poor air quality from dust blowing off the lake bed will exacerbate our current struggles with asthma and other respiratory illnesses. The question is, what can Salt Lake City do about this? Well, we can change what homeowners associations are allowed to restrict by defining outdoor water use not by minimum amounts of green grass, but by maximum amounts of green grass. These include contributing more money to Salt Lake County's efforts in turf conversion to water-wise landscaping. This fund is emptied quickly, indicating that many more people will flip their strips if their money is provided. Additionally, the city could sponsor a declaration recognizing the danger of the Great Salt Lake's lowering water level. If signed by Salt Lake City leaders and other cities leaders in Utah, we can inspire more state-level action to preserve the lake. We appreciate all that has been done so far for the Great Salt Lake and we request further action. This is an opportunity for Salt Lake City to defend the human rights of all Utahns. Hello everybody. Um, my name is Lainey Hall and I am a senior this year at Highland High School. And this is my first year as a member of YCG, but I can say with certainty it has been one of the most impactful things I have participated in my high school experience. This program has taught me valuable skills on how to understand and work with data to achieve a common and visible goal, and the importance of critical thinking with the context of civic engagement. One of my favorite memories from this year was working with the Utah Food Bank to promote awareness on food insecurity in Utah and to increase support and stability for communities across the state. It was inspiring to see how so many people can come together and unite under the consensus of a common goal. Working with elected officials and stakeholders at a local and state level, as well as learning about Utah's governmental structures, has inspired me to seek change in the world around me. It has shown me the importance of voting and that every single vote can make a difference in a world that is constantly changing. Recognizing the value of diverse perspectives, including those of youth, in decision-making processes is crucial for fostering inclusive and impactful change. This year has been a great one, and I will forever be grateful for the opportunity that YCG has given me. Thank you all for listening to us today and supporting U City Government. Thank you all. Council, any, I mean, aside from just automatically adopting everything they suggested and doing it immediately, anything else? <laughs> Councilwoman Young? 
Yeah, so I just want to thank every single one of you for um, dedicating your time to be able to bring the youth voice here to Salt Lake City um, and to bring it to us as council members. So it is one thing to have an opinion. It is another to come with facts, challenges, and solutions, which is what I heard from each of you today. I'm incredibly inspired by the fact that you are our next generation of city leaders who will be sitting up here in the near future. And just thank you with all of my gratitude for, for being willing to serve and be a leader for your peers in this space. Thank you. Councilmember Pui. If we're all gonna go, we're gonna be succinct. I, yeah, I am tr I'm gonna try. I obviously am incredibly inspired by all of you and, uh, and it, it helps uh me to gain more courage uh, and to stand up for the things that you bring to the table uh and to to fight um for your voices too uh when we're talking to our state leaders and our county leaders and our federal delegation uh so thank you for bringing your voice thank you for doing your homework thank you for all that background uh and and i saw myself a little bit on you uh, when I was uh, a, a young and uh, thinking that politics was the best and policy was even better. Um, and most people didn't get it. Uh, but I happen to have an opportunity right now to influence things. And you are the leaders of now also. So thank you for your, for your power. Thank you for your voices uh, and continue that. Okay, fine. <laughs> you don't have to. No, I just, I really appreciate it. And I, and I, I think what I'll say, uh, agree with everything. I really appreciate your courage. Um, but I really love seeing some of you year over year. Dia, we've seen you a lot. Um, Wild, Wild Violet, we've seen you several years as well. Feels like we've gotten to know you. And I really appreciate your participation in this program. Can't wait to get to know the rest of you as as well as we know uh, these two. And so best of luck graduating and, and in next phase of your life. I can't wait to see what you do. I just wanna say thank you. And as uh, the oldest sister to three other young siblings in particular, I have two young sisters that don't speak up on issues because they're learning process just like you are. And what I heard today was a voice representing those that are going to participate even later on. In and as we look at raising sales taxes, as we look at building affordable housing, we're building it for the next generation for you to participate in. So thank you for encouraging us. You give me great strength and uh, it, gosh, it makes me feel quite old actually. I'm not, I'm not that young anymore. You so. not to say things like that. <laughs> no, but sincerely. <laughs> <laughs> sincerely, thank you. Councilmember Wharton. Uh, just want to thank you all for coming again. I, I think this is the most that we've had do one uh, since I've been on the council, do one um, state of the city speech. And I thought you all did an excellent job. Um, it was great hearing the issues that, that you identified, the challenges that you identified, like council member Young said. And then also, you know, it's not easy to, um, you know, do all that work and then actually show up and, and speak and share your opinion publicly about what you think and what was most important to you, that that takes a lot of courage as well. Um, and so commend you for that and um, congratulations on a great speech. And I also look forward to seeing more of you, even those of you that are graduating, I hope you'll let us know what you're off to because um, it's been great working with all of you. So thank you. You guys are very impressive. I, I was nowhere near your maturity when I was your age. I was nowhere at your maturity when I graduated from college. So you guys are uh, the future. And I love your voice. Keep your voice strong. Don't waver in it. Keep your passion strong. And uh, continue reading. Uh, because uh, you are the leaders that we need to see. Uh, coming through the doors. So thank you very much for all your work and uh, can't wait to read more about you. Since I'm chair, I get to say the last word. Um, thank you all for lending your talents, your time to do this, to being good examples to your peers. I think what I love is that right now the world is angry 
and rightfully so. We've got war. We've got, we've got, you know, polarization. We have a terrible air quality. We've got all sorts of things that we shouldn't have if we're so civilized. And what I love is that you all didn't come in with just a list of grievances. You identified the things that were wrong and you identified possible, possible paths to improving them. I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to do everything that we want to do to correct the problems that we inherited before we pass the baton to you. But I want to encourage you to stay focused on you doing your next part. We're going to do our best to do what we can so that you inherit a better housing situation, so you inherit a little bit better air quality, whatever it is. But stay focused on those solutions. Don't surrender your power to just complaining, to just being negative, to just outlining grievances. I suspect this is in no small part to your mentor, who is a great example of how to do this, even under dire circumstances, against great odds. But as you go, don't surrender just to the anger, just to the discouragement. Take your mental health breaks. Find your people who are going to fill your cup when it gets, gets empty. But I promise you, we're going to do our best to make sure you inherit something a little bit better than what we got. And please stay focused and you do the next. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you, leaders of the program, for bringing such an amazing presentation to us. We look forward to next year. Thank you. All right, council, we will be recessing. Oh, do you want to do a picture? Okay, before we do that, we will recess uh, for 30 minutes. Please stick around for a picture, but let's reconvene at 6.30, please. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, we are going to start now with a budget amendment number five follow up for fiscal year 23 24. Ben Ludke, if you would join us at the table, and we'll have all sorts of uh, finance office people for backup if we need them. You may recall last Tuesday, uh, Council reviewed five time sensitive items. And then at the formal meeting, you closed the public hearing and adopted those same five items. The next potential adoption vote is scheduled for May 21st. Uh, I'll go through the remaining items and I'm gonna start with A2 because the council had several follow-up questions. This was a request for $1.1 million one time from general fund balance for police officer recruitment and retention bonuses. This is the $8,500, and that is what the officer receives. The city pays more than that to cover the taxes and the Utah retirement system pensionable cost. There is also $264,000 ongoing, specifically for lateral police officer hires. So, the council's questions and the department's responses are in the staff report, but I'll give you some highlights. The council had asked about outcomes and comparisons in particular. The department said there has been, over the last year, last 12 months, there has been a 27% reduction in police officer separations. And then they looked at the last 24 months and they said it was a 40% reduction over the previous two years. So they view the program as being successful in helping the department get up to full staffing levels. A reminder, the bonuses come with a two-year commitment of employment. If the officer leaves before the two years, they repay the city a prorated amount of the 8500 uh, comparables. HR was able to confirm uh, with 18 other law enforcement agencies along the Wasatch Front whether they offer bonus programs. Not all of them do. Of the ones that do, and there are several nuances, so it's not an exact apples to apples comparison, but looking just at the amount that goes to the officer, the city's $8,500 is the most generous 
by $3,500. So the next uh, competitor's amount was 5,000. The participation rate in the program, 95% as of three weeks ago. So 95% of sworn police officers have agreed to participate. The department is requesting the 264,000 to be ongoing only for lateral hiring bonuses because they want to continue prioritizing laterals as one of the points of their staffing strategy. The council did ask staff to look at alternative funding options instead of pulling all of this from general fund balance. There are two. There's $195,000 available in unused ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act. The council previously budgeted all of the city's ARPA funds. These were budgeted but unused. It would be helpful to spend these remaining ARPA dollars because there are upcoming deadlines from the US Treasury. The other one is vacancy savings in the police department. The department estimates $857,000 are available in vacancy savings. However, they view those as an important part of their budget in case at the end of the fiscal year, there is a major public safety incident that requires significant overtime. The council does consider vacancy savings, especially this late in the year. Uh, otherwise, it just lapses to fund balance. But because of that potential cost, especially late at the fiscal year, leaving some of those vacancy savings is probably needed. If you don't want to touch the vacancy savings, you could ask the administration to look at other funding opportunities for how to address end of fiscal year overtime needs in the police department as part of their zero-based budget exercise next fiscal year. Vacancy savings are unpredictable. We do not know how much is going to be available at the end of each fiscal year. Especially as the police department gets up to full staffing and it looks that, like that is possible next fiscal year, that will mean even less vacancy savings are available next year. So the question for the council is, would you like to use the $195,000 from ARPA instead of general fund balance? Would you like to use any of the vacancy savings? And do you have additional questions about the overall funding or the one-time ongoing, or excuse me, the ongoing funding for lateral hires? Council? Council Member Dugan? I'm uh, all for using the 195,000 from the ARPA, and if necessary, using some of the vacancy savings, because uh, I'm not sure how much we would need over the last month or so of uh, the fiscal year to cover any uh, unforeseen emergency. We, we can ask the department what they would be comfortable with, um, <laughs> but we'll get back to you. And, I, and I'm not sure if we need to make the decision on the uh, ongoing lateral hiring. I think that's a, a good way to uh, bring on experienced police officers as long as we're making sure that we vet them properly to our standards uh, and not just hire uh, experienced officers from other departments without doing a, a good job. And I think the police, top, police department is doing a good job of uh, hiring those lateral transfers. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> are we straw polling this or are we just waiting until the 21st? Waiting until the 21st. Perfect. We did all the straw polled items last Tuesday. Perfect. Also, there's no formal meeting to vote tonight. All right. Uh, next is A4. And if I'm jumping around a little, it's because you already voted on those five urgent items. Uh, A4, this is $3 million in appropriation from the state legislature for working on irrigation system upgrades as well as road reconstructions in the city cemetery. Now, this would be additional funding to the $11.2 million from the sales tax revenue bond you approved in 2022. The city also received $1 million in a private donation. So this item, plus the two previous appropriations, that's over $15 million for road repairs 
and irrigation system replacements and upgrades in the city cemetery. The council approved a cemetery master plan several years ago. At the time, it had <clears throat> estimated the total need for capital improvements. It was a bit over $30 million. So this 15 million, it's not going to meet all of the needs at the city cemetery, but it will go a long way in making an improvement there. The project is anticipated to go out to bid this coming summer. Uh, moving on to A5. This is a request for $450,000 one time from general fund balance to add traffic signals at 2200 West and 2100 North at the intersection. The intersection currently has two stop signs, so there's no automated traffic signal there today. The traffic volumes on the streets have increased significantly faster than what was projected. The speed on 2100 North is 45 miles per hour. And when you're going that fast, trying to judge gaps in traffic is significantly more difficult. And the drivers who are waiting to turn off of 2200 West, because there's not a traffic signal where they know they'll get their turn, they are taking more risks. Mm -hmm. And there has been an increase in accidents, including severe injuries. Typically, this is a kind of project you would see in the annual competitive CIP process. And that is a standing item that is in CIP every year, including in the proposed CIP budget for fiscal year 2025. The reason this is coming to the council in a budget amendment is because it is a legitimate and a serious safety issue in the opinion of the transportation division. The council has previously said that when there are urgent and serious safety issues, that coming in a mid-year budget amendment is an option instead of waiting for the once a year annual competitive CIP process. I, I, obviously, I don't challenge the urgency of the matter if the administration has rec like found that this is an urgent matter. But I'm a little confused, not confused, but I'm wondering, uh, is that what a four-way traffic stops light cost? Like almost half a million dollars now? Uh, it does. If you went back about four years, it was closer to $250,000. Oh. Th this is one of the examples of inflation. This sheen where we need him to be. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, this is, this is in, uh, half a million dollars for, for, uh, uh, for lights. Uh, so I, I, I just like it's good for me to know that this is every time that we talk about um, uh, we talk about uh, lights that we need to think about the cost of them. And this is one of those items you see every year in CIP where if we were funding it at the ideal level, we would probably want to fund two or three a year, and we historically have not done that. Is, is there any need for pedestrian crossing on this uh, in this area, or is it just uh, vehicular? Mostly vehicular. Yeah, my, my understanding is it it's not close enough to uh, hire pedestrian traffic. And it's exacerbated at certain hours because Boeing is out there, and so that when the Boeing shifts change, there's massive influx and outflow of cars. And so it's, um, it really is vehicular and dependent on commute times. Councilwoman Young, did you have something? Councilmember Dugan. Ben, I want to challenge the transportation department on a red light. If there's this much traffic on one side, this should be a roundabout. <laughs> then the traffic doesn't stop and it flows and it moves so much easier. So I would challenge the the uh, transportation department on this need for a, a light. I think a light would actually be uh, not energy, not only uh, air quality wise, because you have people, if there's a big population stopping here for a couple minutes, they're just gonna flow through and a roundabout would be much uh, better use and it probably wouldn't be cost uh, that much more than uh, $500,000. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would challenge them to that instead of a light. So are you withholding funding from this? I, I'd, I'd, say, I'd want to see a little bit more than just a traffic light, because I think that's, uh, and I, uh, that's just Dan Dugan talking at, at this moment, but I think this land out there looks like there's availability to do it. It's kind of a, uh, a perfect example where one would be, uh, could be used. 
Anyone else? Anyone, if anyone's here from the transportation division, uh, they're, they're welcome to speak about a roundabout versus a traffic signal. That's, that's outside my expertise. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that. I'm just, I'm throwing that back at the transportation. We'll ask them for the pros and cons and why one is recommended. If there's nothing else on this one, I'll keep going. Uh, A6. This is a request for $47,000 one time for a police impact fees refund. These were previously appropriated for a property acquisition for an east side police precinct. In the city's impact fees plan, that is the only capital project listed, which means it's the only eligible expense for police impact fees. That property acquisition was unsuccessful. There is not an alternative uh, property acquisition where these could be reappropriated to, and state law requires impact fees to be spent within six years of the city receiving them. We are beyond the six-year clock. So because there's not an alternative eligible project, because we're past the six-year clock, the only other option is if there is prior projects that the general fund paid for, which were eligible for police impact fees. There's a term of art called excess capacity for that option. The city has already maximized that option under the current impact fees plan, so these do need to be refunded, unfortunately. The administration is working to update the impact fees plan. The fire, parks, and police sections were last updated in 2016. Uh, we've had impact fee consultants recommend updating uh, closer to every five years, so they, they would benefit from an update. Anyone? Okay. Uh, next, A7, this is also impact fees, but it's the fourth type, transportation impact fees. This is a request for $60,000 to update the transportation section of the impact fees plan. This one was recently updated in 2020, and part of that was to leverage the streets reconstruction bond projects with this funding source to make the bond funds go further. The last of those bond projects is expected to be completed next year. So updating the transportation section for what the city wants to prioritize after the bond proceeds are all spent is why this update is proposed. The nice thing about updating the impact fee plan is it's 100% eligible for impact fees. So we can use the impact fees to update that section of the plan. Moving on to A9. This is a request for $130,000 one time from general fund balance for the mobile clean team. The mobile clean team had the uh, services increased earlier this fiscal year from five days a week to seven days a week. This is provided by a contract between the city and Advantage Services. Now the services include voluntary trash removal from active encampments, cleanup of abandoned encampments, and bio waste removal. And the bio waste removal is available on private property sometimes. The rest of this is public property. You might remember the last annual budget, you added $598,000. So the total ongoing budget is $1.4 million. That would remain the same. This is one-time funding for $131,000. So that from May through the end of the fiscal year, just those several weeks, the seven days a week enhanced level of cleaning can continue. In the annual budget, you'll see there are some expenses being reduced in order to shift those funds to these seven days a week cleanings so that the $1.4 million budget will still be able to provide that enhanced level of service. Yes, sir. I would love to uh, get more information about this. Certainly, this is an important piece of the whole equation. Um, but I, um, I would like to know how many, I don't know if we're tracking this uh, nasty information, but how much of uh, the cleanups uh, touch by a waste, um, you know, uh, 
because if we're hearing about uh, the, the bathroom situation and and the bathrooms are not being utilized, uh, I also would like to know how much of we're spending to clean up bio waste from the streets and sidewalks to try to get a better picture about the whole thing. Uh, if if I if I'm following. Knowing where the clean team is needed would inform where public bathroom access is also. I mean, ultimately, but I, but I want to know from, you know, from advantage, uh, if we're tracking, you know, bio waste and, uh, you know, if there are numbers related to that. And certainly that will give us an idea of how much need there may be regarding to uh, the lack of places to dispose, the correct places to dispose bio waste, i.e. bathrooms. Okay. I think Andrew might have something on metrics. Andrew Johnson from the mayor's office. Uh, Michelle Hoon is out of town, otherwise she could answer more thoughtfully than I could. Uh, the, the request is um, linked to police work as well. So when police officers are enforcing ordinances specific to uh, camping or other things that have waste associated with them, um, they're doing it seven days a week all over the city. Uh, when an officer does that and somebody picks up their stuff and leaves, oftentimes they leave a lot of stuff. And on the weekends, there's no way to clean that up. And so by Monday, it tends to get um, uh, people come back to it and set up again and add more stuff. And so the work really is, is kind of useless on a Saturday and Sunday in the officer's view. So they've struggled with that. Um, so we've had the request was to increase to seven days a week so that when an officer or officers did some work, there was cleaning available immediately to make sure it was cleaned up so it didn't get worse uh, within a couple of days. The the numbers you're looking for for uh, bio waste, we do have them. We can get them to you. Um, that's not necessarily the core of this. This is more of a seven day a week versus five day a week coverage. And I'm not challenging the, the request. I think this is a good request, and I will personally, I would love to support it. But I, I'm, I'm trying to prove or disprove my hypothesis regarding, uh, you know, the issue of bio waste, uh, and, and this piece of information may help me understand a little better. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, moving on. Uh, next up is D3. This is a follow-up item from the council's annual HUD grants deliberations back in uh, March and early April. You may recall at the public hearing, the director of the county housing authority notified the city that at the recommended funding level for their HOPWA rental assistance program, they would not be able to continue providing housing assistance to all of the households that were currently reliant on that program. They needed about $28,000 more. We were able to identify $100,000 of a community recovery assistance grant related to the pandemic that the city had awarded to the Rape Recovery Center. They came back to the city and said, we are not able to use this uh, by the end of 2024. That is the deadline uh, in law. So that $100,000 has been recaptured. It is proposed to use almost $28,000 of that to go to the County Housing Authority's HOPWA rental assistance program to make sure that there are no evictions or loss of that rental assistance. And moving forward, applications related to housing for those annual HUD grants will ask about minimum funding needed to avoid loss of housing. So that's a process improvement to try and avoid this late surprise in the process in future years. That leaves available funding of $72,000 from the recaptured $100,000 from the Rape Recovery Center. The administration is recommending the $72,000 go to Neighborhood House's Early Childhood Education Program. Uh, this applicant was disqualified from the CDBG applications this year because they inadvertently applied for the wrong grant. So they did apply, they did not receive funding because of that mistake. So this would award funding to them and they are a long time uh, applicant. They've received funding for, I think a couple decades through that program. So woman young. So just a quick question, noting that these are so time sensitive, um, is this one where there's a mechanism by which we could indicate support to allow 
the recipients to get going? So I did ask uh, about timeliness to the county housing authority's director, and she said that the the risk of housing loss was at the end of the year Got it. because okay. they had enough funding for like 11 months and it was that last month where they would not have enough. Okay, thank you. Ben, maybe one or two more? Yes. We have only three left. Can we do them real quick? The next one, uh, D6, this is the biggest item in the budget amendment, $22 million. This is for the airport. And this is increasing the interest expense on their existing bonds. Uh, they inadvertently used a different measure of the interest expense that didn't include capitalizing the interest. Instead of paying the interest, you add it to the principal. So that's why this is larger. Uh, they do have the funds to cover this. Uh, it is a significant item. It's quite large, but they do have the funding for it. D7 is a request for $250,000 of unused funds from prior year downtown open Main Street events. This would be rescoping those funds to hold an open streets event this year in the fall. And it would not be downtown, it would be in the granary. And it would be a smaller scale event. That's why the total budget is 250,000 instead of in previous years, the council has funded between 400 dollars and $750,000. Economic development said they do not anticipate any further requests for the event. Uh, there are some policy questions if the council's interested. Uh, such as holding the event in the summer versus the fall, if there are preferences, uh, if the council is interested about moving, migrating the event into different business districts uh, year to year versus keeping it in the downtown. Councilwoman Chavez. <laughs> I'm just smiling because I think part of the the uh, importance of open streets is you can take tracks to get there. And I was just thinking in proximity for Granary, we would all have to drive to there. So it's just kind of, I guess, a comment to my co-counselors or so. I feel like it's getting to a place where it feels like we should have a policy discussion about mm -hmm. what we're doing with this. I felt like open streets was to prove if the, the concept if, of, of walkability mm -hmm. and i think it's proven that it's more than just a proof of concept that maybe it's something that constituents enjoy enough that we should mm -hmm. do but i think we should pivot in our conceptualization mm -hmm. and what we're doing and just get a little more serious about it instead of it being so kind of responsive to like ad hoc pressures mm -hmm. council me council member Pui? i, I I'm, I'm a little confused about this because I well open streets was a response in part to the pandemic and uh, to try to keep those businesses uh, alive and then uh, we realized that it was, was working uh, was it because of the pandemic or not and then the concept of um, and the idea from the administration was like well maybe there is appetite long year round to do something like this and activate main street which is key to the success of down, downtown and moving it c concerns me for those for what is happening in downtown and also i um wonder if the, the, the downtown alliance is going to come back to us for money again which wasn't necessarily the easiest of decisions this last year or this yeah this last year so i mm -hmm. i I'm confused about why we'll be moving that to an area that does have businesses, but not the concentration of businesses that this, uh, Main Street has. So I think maybe the dis discussion or decision we need to reach as a council is, do we want to rescope the outstanding quarter million? And then in addition, does that trigger another conversation about what we're doing with this program? So maybe take that as two things, right? Unless, unless you want to hold this rescoping hostage for a conversation, I don't feel that urgency on this topic. But yeah, I mean, I want to be supportive of, and I really appreciate what you said. I think that's that's brilliant that this is a conceptualized programming for the downtown. And even though Granary is a part of that downtown, 
I think this would make me make more sense if we're going to structure it around neighborhoods in Central 9th, for example, or a street that has better uh, pedestrian modalities and, and landscape for that type of accessibility and then the concentration of businesses. I yeah. just, I, I agree with you. I think granary seems maybe a little bit more odd fit for this type of movement. So do you feel like that discussion needs us to not approve this money to happen or can we do both and with it? Can we approve a rescoping, which as I understand for this year would just be Main Street as we've always conceptualized. The request is not to move it this year. The request is to rescope the remaining funds from last year's event to host an event in the granary. This year. Okay, this that's year. part is missing. Thank but, you. But, but let, me, let me ask a follow up. Maybe I'm not understanding. Okay. So, to rescope the, the unused funds to, do, to hold an event outside the main street, which is in the granary, but are we still doing open streets on main street this year? Not. Not with these funds. Uh, the Downtown Alliance uh, was unable to host open streets on Main Street this year. Uh, so these funds we are diverting to the Granary. Who will be hosting the event in the Granary? Uh, we will be going to RFP and uh, uh, contracting with a, a contractor to host the event in the neighborhood. There's a, there is a request in the non-departmental budget for um, Main Street open streets for next year. Right. Um, that the Downtown Alliance would be part of. But as we understand it, there would be no open streets event on Main Street this summer. Yeah, I I saw, I, you know, I, I, I love the interest of uh, activating some businesses and maybe all the, I support that concept in general. I it felt like I would love to have more uh, information of what we want to accomplish. And if this is, uh, if this is sustainable, I mean, Last year during the budget, we talked with, with, with economic development and other departments about activating North Temple, uh, you know, and the business in North Temple. And uh, obviously that didn't happen, unfortunately. But um, I wonder a little more about this and I would love to have more information. And I, I personally would like to put a pass on this uh, line item. Mayor. Thank you for giving me a moment. Um, the... Part of the difficulty with Downtown Alliance doing it this year is the difficulty in finding out in June mm -hmm. if they're going to get the money and then staffing up to do disparate weekends and bringing in all of the infrastructure. It really doesn't work very well. It wouldn't for any entity. The timing is just not good. The reason we're asking for next year in this budget is because the timing of our contract with the management of downtown and the RFP for that means that we want to be able to do it in the future, but we also have to assure that the funding will be there. Otherwise, we can't put it um, out there for them to respond to. The reason we, since we have the funding left over from last year that we looked at the granary, which we've talked about a little bit with you and more to come in your budget deliberations, is the Opportunity Zone investment interest in the Green Loop and the rather short timeline for that money. And so we thought this might be a good experiment to see what a green loop type activation could be in that area of the city. I hope that helps. That helps me a lot because, you know, I, I, I worry sometimes about, you know, trying to chew too much, um, but I understand what you're trying to accomplish with this fund a little bit better. Um, I, I think because of the conversations related to the, to the green loop uh, are coming up and they're coming up to us in different uh, entities and, and, and right now on the budget session, I would like to still learn a little more about this, uh, but I appreciate the, the, the background. Anyone else? Councilmember Wharton. When would, um, aside from like the sooner the better, but um, when would I don't want to put us in the same situation of where we've had in previous years of approving the funds so late that it's hard to program. Like, what's the timeline for this? For this year's event, uh, we'll be in the fall. Oh, but right. So, so if we do it during the normal budget, Correct. if we have this that conversation gives, during that, that's a that's enough time. That gives the downtown alliance ample lead time. No, to be that, there there are two different things going on. 
Sorry, just to clarify. She just said for Open Streets for Main Street, we're putting it in the regular budget because that gives the Downtown Alliance time to do their pre-planning so that we are getting good quality. They have plenty of organizational bandwidth for, to deal with But it. for the granary. This rescoped one right. would be a reappropriation of the money for the fall, focusing on granary just because we have this quarter million here and an opportunity. Right, but does so, that, does, I heard, <laughs> uh, another council member saying that they want to have this discussion or make this decision after we have uh, the discussion uh, that we're going to have in the budget on Green Loop. Does that give uh, enough time uh, to put out an RFP and to have a plan in the fall for this money? Because this is a budget amendment request. It has to be done before the end of the budget yeah. year. It, we're talking about it kind of in the budget, but it's a budget amendment request, so you could approve it uh -huh. at a different time earlier, theoretically, than the budget full budget. And um, this is like in no way a commitment to the green loop. It's an opportunity to use funds that were dedicated to opening a street to pedestrian uses and try it out in an area that it, we are looking to utilize private dollars on and that's a separate conversation in the budget. Okay, well, let me ask my question a different way then. Um, if we want to wait on this decision until we're having the budget discussions, how are we going to do that? <laughs> I think it will be difficult. Uh -huh. And so I think that, uh, I mean, it's not impossible though, right? I think it just complicates their planning efforts because that money does not become available July 1. Whereas if you approve it in a budget amendment on the 21st, it obviously becomes available immediately and they be begin work immediately. I guess maybe, is it, can you talk more about the impetus to including it in the budget amendment? Yes, so the the original funds were, were slated for the 2023 event. We obviously didn't spend all of that money. Uh, so we pivoted to uh, uh, hosting another event. Uh, we reached out to the Downtown Alliance. Unfortunately, they didn't have time. Uh, with the size of that event, it, it takes a lot of planning. We would like to see this event in other neighborhoods, and so we felt that this was a good opportunity to test it out in another neighborhood that desires an event like Open Streets. And so uh, we're, we were hoping to use uh, this, uh, these funds to, to do exactly that uh, in tandem, uh, testing out new design concepts for the street. And we thought that was a great opportunity to do that as well. I might, I might add that the, the reason of the timing right now is partially that the conversations with Downtown Alliance about their willingness or capacity to do it just this is as fast as we could get to a conclusion to bring it to you. Um, I also would add that it's going to take time to get a contract together for this to be completed in the fall. So if it's in a budget amendment rather than in the budget, we can get so started on the RFQ and get started on the contracts. So we can get the contract signed before July 1st for the contractor. So we're going to buy ourselves another week anyway because we're behind schedule and we need to talk, talk at the attorney's office. So uh, maybe could you connect with Ben and maybe check in with the rest of us on this so we can get clarity on? Yeah, I, I, you know, since this, this connects to the Green Loop, I would like to lear, learn a little more about it. And also the 200 East, uh, we did a test of that last year. Uh, I would like to know what we learned from that and what are we going to do with 200 East. Um, because I... You know, obviously, I have I have a lot so many questions. I still support the general concept, but I still be confused about where all this money is going to come from when we uh, sell it to a neighbor um, and we we give them to we get them to dream about something that we still don't know. How. So I and those are the questions that I would love. I know that you probably worked it out, um, but I would love to learn more about it. And can we check in with you this week and just get more clarity and, and work through some of this? Yep, send me your okay. questions and I'll, I'll reach out as well. Thank you. Then with that, I would like to pivot to um, our last work session item for the evening, which is the fiscal year 2425 budget for the Office of the City Attorney. Sylvia Richards is our Council Policy Analyst who will join us. Katie Lewis, the City Attorney, will join us. Ralph Chamnus, the Chief Deputy Salt Lake County District Attorney's Office. Scott Fisher, the first assistant prosecutor. And is there anyone else here? I've got the possibility that Paige Williamson. You're yes. here, Paige? Okay. 
And I don't, Mark and Sim are not here, so. And then, of course, we have Mary Beth to be the oracle of all things. Mm -hmm. All right, Sylvia, I'm turning the time over to you. The Office of the City Attorney includes four divisions, the Civil Practice Division, the Legislative Affairs Division, Recorder's Office Division, the Risk Management Division, and additionally, the City contracts with the District Attorney's Office to manage um, the prosecutors and staff to provide prosecutor services for the city. The prosecutor's staff, uh, the, the Salt Lake City Justice Court, and the D district attorney's office prosecutors take those cases over when entered into the calendar, the court calendars. The proposed budget for the attorney's office requests 12,881,528 with 66.5 full-time employees, <clears throat> which is an increase of 2.3 million or 22.79% as compared to the fiscal year 24 adopted budget. And the increase is mainly attributed to um, fiscal year 24 salary increases re requested by the prosecutor's office. The annualized cost of four new um, FTEs added in budget amendment number three in 2023, creating the legislative affairs division. The proposed addition of two new FTEs in the mayor's recommended budget, a 5% salary increase proposed for all city employees, ongoing personnel and operating costs for the Legislative Affairs Division and personnel adjustments in the recorder's office. The additional two FTEs requested in the mayor's recommended budget include one new special projects boards compensation analyst position for the recorder's office and one new city prosecutor assistant position for the city prosecutor's office, and then some additional ongoing uh, funding for the legislative affairs division, uh, which was inadvertently um, excluded from the budget amendment number three. And I'll turn that the time over to Katie. Thank you very much, Sylvia. I appreciate it. Um, we can go ahead and advance to the next slide. This is our org chart, and as, as Sylvia said, and I know you all recall, we added a new division at the end of 2023. That was the Legislative Affairs Division. The other divisions in the City Attorney's Office include the Civil Division, Risk Management, the Recorders, and then the Prosecutor's Office pursuant to an interlocal agreement. And you'll hear from us in a couple different budget presentations. Today, we'll be talking about the Civil Division uh, which in, and the Legislative Affairs Division, the Recorder's Office, and the Prosecutor's Office. You'll hear from Risk in a couple other presentations because they are funded by both governmental immunity and general fund. Uh, a couple things that I just wanted to share with you about the city attorney's office is we, our civil division is currently fully staffed right now. We've got 19 attorneys and that includes, as I, I hope you don't mind me sharing what I believe to be the most sophisticated, creative and professional team of attorneys that I've ever worked with and they represent the city on all matters from litigation to transactional to advising proactively on all of our legal issues. We also have the recorder's office, which has really taken a citywide lens on records management, Open Meetings Act, transparency and technology. We've got a risk management team that's currently fully staffed and taking a citywide and proactive approach. And then of course the Legislative Affairs Division uh, did uh, just an outstanding job this legislative session, helping the city with its proactive goals and also ensuring that we were at the table when we needed to be. Uh, I have a couple slides to talk about our budget presentation and then I'll hand it over to Ralph, Scott and Paige to talk about the prosecutor's office. Next slide. 
The first category of budget requests that we're making, we've framed as operational requests. And as Sylvia noted, when the Legislative Affairs Division was created, there was not an ongoing budget appropriation for operating costs. So that's everything from professional development to traveling to conferences to ensuring that they've got the passes and the access that they need up on the Hill. And so that's that $80,000 is for the Legislative Affairs Division's operations, which currently have been taken out of the civil division's budget for this this year since they were created. The second category is professional development. Our office uh, attends national conferences with the International Municipal Lawyers Association in addition to other conferences and we have reaped the benefits on all of the issues that we deal with on a national level because Salt Lake City really is dealing with the same legal issues that our very large urban uh, sister cities are dealing with. A couple examples of that are homelessness issues, union negotiations, and negotiation on major league sports. This budget request will help us continue to provide that high level and nationwide service that, that we have come to expect of all of our lawyers. Next slide, please. These budget requests are the, our category of personnel funds. I will leave the prosecutor request to Ralph, Scott, and Paige. And I'd actually like to start with the recorder request. Uh, a couple things I'd like to point out here. We are requesting one new FTE for a board compensation management and special projects analyst. That individual will essentially be taking functions from various city departments and bringing them all in-house in the recorder. So everything from coordinating with HR and finance related to compensating board members and onboarding board members, consistent training, assisting the mayor's office with any um, various requests that they may have related to uh, appointing board members. This is all something that's become a big enough task for the city that we really need one FTE to do that. We're also asking for this person to have financial experience so that we can continue to ha have someone support the entire city attorney's office department on financial and compensation issues. We also are asking for some reclassification of positions in the recorder's office, and that has to do with the citywide service that I mentioned before. Our recorders are more technically engaged than we've ever seen the recorder's office, and I mean that both from a records perspective and also from truly a technology perspective. And the reclassification is a reflection of that more highly technical, sophisticated, and citywide work. And then the, the final reclassification that touches on all three of our divisions, risk, legislative affairs, and the recorder, is a reclassification of those three division directors uh, from either a 35 or a 34 to a 38. My request for that is really from a, a leadership perspective and a, ensuring that those three leaders in my office are being compensated for the high level and sophisticated work that they do. Angela Price's legislative affairs director position was classified as a 34. And as we've gone back and looked at the level of work she's doing and what her counterparts at the state level are doing, that really should have been a 38. So that was kind of building the plane as it was flying and then needing to come back and revisit it. And as we revisited that, uh, it, it was, it's my recommendation that the two other division directors, the risk manager and the recorder, should be equally compensated so that there isn't any inequity between those three leadership positions in my office. And then finally, the, the final uh, point to make on legislative affairs is we are requesting to reclassify one position that the council approved to a deputy director for Angela's division. And that is because, again, when we requested the positions, we weren't totally sure what she needed. And now that she's been through a legislative session, we've concluded she needs one more person with really a, a high level of policy and communication skills that can be her right hand up on the Hill as she's working through various legislative issues. Next slide.
Uh, before I go to that one, I do want to just say in conclusion, although Sylvia pointed out that it sounds like we're asking for a 22% increase for this budget request, in the mayor's budget request, those insights that I just talked to you actually equal about 527,000. And the, the other uh, increases have to do with truing up from the budget amendments in the last year, both the prosecutor's salaries that were approved last year and also the Legislative Affairs Division. So I just wanted to clarify that our ask for this fiscal year is $527,000. Do you have any questions for me before I turn it over to the prosecutors? No question, but I, I think context is important and you added to that context, but I will like to add to the context from my point of view uh, and the amount of, of, of work uh, that the legislative team has done uh, for this city will never be recognized by the constituents. Uh, the tracking of hundreds of bills, uh, giving us insight, uh, uh, live insight to try to respond to the work immediately. I, I, there is not enough uh, to to compensate for for that work and um, and also uh, I thank you for for the creation of that position thank you for for the, the oversight on that and certainly also for our recorder the amount of uh, meetings that we, we we have the amount of uh, platforms that we share uh, our meetings through uh, the, the amount of a technology that we are uh, managing here uh, and, and the needs of, of many of us is just uh, incredible. So I, I, I support all of these uh, adjustments. So thank you. Thank you very much. It is an outstanding team and I'm very proud to be a part of it. That's it. Great. And I will hand it over to Ralph, Scott and Paige. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Um, I guess we'll start by um, saying thanks for uh, the salary increases from uh, the last year, both to you and to the mayor's office. It's made a huge difference in, in allowing us to stay uh, staffed with prosecutors. It's been a, a huge difference where we've been down as many as five prosecutors at a, at a time over the last few years. Um, that has made us um, uh, market competitive and uh, so thank you for that it's it's huge uh, in terms of our ask for this year we're asking for one prosecutor assistant and that is necessitated by the change in the way the justice court is doing its business um, looking at the slide that we've got up right now um, the um, uh, prior model under judge Baxter was a judge a uh, one judge dedicated to arraignments so that um, we had five judges. One judge, Judge Baxter, every day of the week would sit on arraignments, which was the first appearance. And um, the defendants would come in, be arraigned at the first appearance, uh, offers, some cases would be resolved, other cases would move through the pipeline. So here you see we had one prosecutor assistant um, who put together those files each week and uh, moved them to the attorney or attorneys who were handling the cases in front of Judge Baxter. Judge Baxter would handle those. Those files would return to that prosecutor assistant, um, a little more prep work done. Then they would go to the prosecutor assistants uh, who were assigned to the remaining four judges for additional uh, court hearings, pre-trials, law in motion, bench trials, jury trials. And so those prosecutor assistants would assemble um, the files um, adding uh, criminal histories, requesting additional discovery, that kind of thing. Crucial function, both um, at the arraignment stage and then downstream in front of the um, other judges that were handling the different matters. Now, if we could go to the, um, so that gave us, and the way we had it assigned, we had two prosecutor assistants in front of each of those four judges. So we had eight there, plus the one at arraignments. So if we go to the next slide. Thanks. So now with Judge Baxter's retirement, the Justice Court has moved to a rotating arraignment judge model. And so that means now all five of those judges rotate through uh, week by week, 
um, through the arraignment calendar, which means they each handle one week of arraignment, then they drop back into the rest of their calendar, another judge rotates into arraignment, and it's that kind of a cycle. So with two prosecutor assi uh, assistants assigned to each courtroom, that's the goal. We're short of that, and that's why we're asking for the one prosecutor assistant, because right now we've got nine. With five judges, we need 10. Um, the two prosecutor assistants in the new system, those two, uh, the uh, incoming cases are divided by alphabet. They prepare those files again, assemble police reports, uh, the different materials that the prosecutors need for the arraignment. They now go to whatever um, judge, to their judge, from the prosecutor assistants assigned to that judge uh, on a weekly basis. And then that judge arraigns them. Those cases then are sent back to the prosecutor assistants. They do additional work on the cases that um, were not resolved and that are moving on to pretrial and uh, other hearings. And so they do additional work on those. And then they move through a cycle of, again, pretrials, bench trials, lawn motion, jury trials there. So where we're short, the one PA, we have one senior prosecutor assistant who's been handling one judge by herself. And so um, she is covering that in part because of her experience, but she's also um, having to have some overtime to do um, the additional work. And so we're asking for the one additional prosecutor assistant so that we can reach a symmetry there with two prosecutor assistants in front of each judge, a uh, fair, equitable division of the work in front of those judges by alphabet, avoid the burnout of one of our senior prosecutor assistants, um, and that will result in increased efficiencies because our prosecutor assistants are crucial uh, as they prep the files for us, um, take incoming phone calls, um, uh, subpoena witnesses, um, help us out with victims, those kinds of things. So um, this will result in better service, increased efficiencies, and uh, benefit in the hopes that we don't burn out one of our employees. So thanks very much, and are there any questions? Um, has the workload increased, or is it more just a division, equitable division of the current workload? It's an equitable division of the current workload that we're concerned about, right? Now. Are we behind in cases? I mean, I, I understand there's a, a huge backlog in some certain cases, but in processing, it sound like this is just for arraignments. Is that correct? Uh, no, this, this will work across the entire uh, spectrum of cases from arraignment, then as the files move from arraignment to pretrial, to lawn motion, to bench trial, to jury trial. So uh, the benefit will go through that entire cycle, uh, the whole lifetime cycle of all those cases, and through every courtroom, through all five of the judges. And just to add to that, I think what we're looking at is compression of the workload as well. Sorry, can you, picture, could you turn oh, on the Sorry, mic? can you hear me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, great. I think we're looking at compression of the workload as well. Um, where it was set out further, when we only had a four-judge model, there were only so many spaces, uh, so many pretrials, so many trial dates to put on. Now that we have five, we have more spaces, but they're compressed, they're shorter, they're being set sooner. Um, in addition, an arraignment, um, a uh, PA assigned to arraignments was only prepping a report, a wrap, a driver's license, and a triple I, which is a multi state wrap. Um, once they're prepping cases for pretrial and trial, we're looking at subpoenas, additional discovery, uh, uh, evidence ordering, video, et cetera. And so it's a, it's a whole different ballgame there. I, I remember in 2020, and I'm sure Chris, you understand this as the attorney on the council, but uh right like pre-trial dates were being set way out way 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 out and so this will help with uh processing these cases that we need to we need to obviously um, go through in our judicial process so uh, one other thing uh, with the compression is there was also a rule change that required the discovery go out sooner uh within five days of an information being filed so that's compressed it even a little bit further council anything else okay Thank you all so much. Thank Have you. A wonderful Thanks evening. Sim sends his apologies. He had a prior commitment. So if there are questions you want to talk to Tell him we missed him. He'll be available. All right. Uh, so report of the chair and vice chair. Vice chair, do you have anything? I do not. Um, I actually do want to take a minute and just report out. I know that the public um, 
is clamoring for just any information we can get. So I want to be a little transparent about some meetings um, I was able to have. And if you all have any that you want to share, I encourage it. Um, relating to the SEG developments, this week I had the possibility, I had the opportunity to join with several other council members and the mayor. And we met with representatives of Japantown. And honestly, it was a really humbling space to be in, to recognize how much had been taken through eminent domain from the Japanese community, the dehumanizing circumstances that brought so many Japanese constituents to this place, and now the opportunity to stand at this moment in history and leverage this catalytic, catalytic opportunity to not completely restore but envision what a new honoring, what a 21st century conceptualization of centering that population. So um, if anyone who's listening, any of the general public is interested in that, I know Council Member Mano in particular did a wonderful job of presenting history and possibility there. Um, but those conversations were ongoing. And another one that Council Member Pui and I got to uh, do together. So I think most of you know that I come from music. I thought I was going to be a music professor. I am not. So um, uh, Mayor Wilson came with Erin Litvak, her deputy mayor, and Mike Mon, and uh, Council Member Pui and I met with three members of the Utah Symphony. And not only in that meeting did we hear that the musicians, not just the administration, would be granted a seat at the table. But we heard Mike Mon say the phrase, we commit to you that no brick will be moved on the Delta Center until we figured out where you're going, how you're getting there, and how we're paying for it. Now we've since seen Mayor Wilson tweet out an increased um, support for uh, preserving Abravnel. But um, I know that this is one of those things that data, one of those data points that a lot of people around town seem to be wanting information on. And so I think it's fair to transparently share. I will also share that as someone who has been in that space, um, as someone from the Latino population, when you combine black and Latino musicians together, we make up only two to 4% of the international classical music workforce. Um, and so even though music is considered, this music is for everyone kind of pithy thing, it is inherently unequal. And in our own Abravanel Hall, we have dreadful inequalities, including the fact that it is not ADA compliant because of the slope of the floor, which changing will change the acoustic environment. So whatever our plans are, I happen to like the building and I am share an emotional attachment, I've been there, but whatever we do, um, the, the entire experience this week has proven to me that this is not just an engine of economic development, this is not at all just about hockey. This isn't just about urban planning. We have the chance to stand in a moment and correct historic inequities, whether we're talking about what happened to the Japanese population, whether we're talking about who can access the arts here in Abravanel Hall, and whether we're talking about what the future looks like for people to be able to enjoy that area of town. So it's a little longer than I would usually do, but I feel like at this moment of time, I want to err on the side of transparency and let people know the conversations I'm having. If you all feel a similar impulse, um, I'm happy to work with you all and we can create a forum for that. I think it's important that our constituents know, especially because of this protracted timeline, how seriously we are taking these deliberations and how the work for me at least has felt like it's never ending. Um, but that's where I am. Does anyone else have anything else they want to share in the same? Councilmember Romano. Madam Chair, I'll just say thank you to yourself, Council Pe Chair Petro, Councilmember Lopez Chavez, Mayor Mendenhall, and then they're probably not listening, but Mike Mon and Mayor Jenny Wilson for coming to the forum with Japanese American community, the Buddhist temple, and the Japanese Church of Christ. I had um, people tell me afterwards that that's the first time they've had that much hope about Japantown since the imminent domain happened in the 60s uh, and sincerely t tell me that they felt heard and and listened to so thank you all for your participation in that it meant a lot all right thank you all i and i thank all of you and our staff i don't know how staff is handling budget season and these deliberations but thank you for whatever herculean feat strength you are
tapping into to do this. All right, um, then with that, do we have any reports from the executive director? None today. All right, then we are going to move into closed session. Um, if I could get a motion for att attorney client matters and when we come out, we will be adjourned. And I'm sure I move that we go into closed session for the purpose of receiving attorney client um, advice. Second. I have a motion from council member Wharton and a second from council member Dugan. Any discussion? I'll roll call Dugan. Yes. Lopez Travis. Aye. Wharton. Aye. Mano. Yes. Pui. Aye. Young. Yes. And I'm a C si senor. So <laughs> that passes unanimously. We are in closed session. Of course.